be strict in keeping the time. So really, accept my apologies uh, from the very beginning, uh, and uh, I hope I won't have to, to cut any of the talks. Uh, if there will be questions uh, and there is no time left in your time slot, uh, I will ask people to ask to send them directly to you. Or if we have a bit of time at the end of the session, I can uh, collect one or two questions uh, and, uh, and, and read them to you. Okay. Um, what else? Uh, okay, I will give you a warning uh, more or less halfway through your talk, uh, but I will tell you individually. So I think we can start. It's uh, 11.30 sharp in Sao Paulo. Joaquim. Okay, I can't hear you. Now you can hear me, right? Oh, yes. Now, now we Okay. Can. Great. Okay. So, so Joaquin, you're going to have 25 minutes. Uh, I'm going to give you a warning after 15. Perfect. Thank you. So thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this fantastic workshop. Um, the topic of my talk is going to be dark matter at cosmological phase transition. So we are going to switch gears a little bit, going more from, from the, the detectional aspects of dark matter towards the question, how can dark matter be made in the early universe? So the motivation for this is, um, of course, the fact that the uh, most conventional dark matter production mechanism in the early universe, namely thermal freeze out, has not manifested itself yet in experiments. So um, while this is not a showstopper yet, um, it is still a pity that we have not found the more conventional WIMPs yet, neither in direct searches, nor in indirect searches, nor in collider searches. The plot that you see on, here on the right is uh, one that all of you have seen before. The horizontal axis here is uh, dark matter mass over temperature, so essentially a measure of cosmological time. The vertical axis is uh, the dark matter number density normalized to the entropy density. So you see that as dark matter freezes out, its abundance departs from the thermal abundance and flattens out and then stays constant. That's the standard freeze out mechanism that I'm not going to go into detail here. Instead, what I want to talk about here is a possible alternative namely that uh, the dark matter abundance that we observe today has not been set by a freeze out, but by the dynamics at cosmological phase transitions. Um, there are at least uh, five to 10 mechanisms by which this can occur. And I'm trying uh, to, to highlight two of those mechanisms in this talk. So before we do that, I'll give you a very quick introduction to phase transitions in general and cosmological phase transitions in particular. And then the two scenarios I want to discuss is first the possibility that there is an intermittent period in the early universe where dark matter can decay. And second, the possibility that uh, phase transitions act as kind of a filter for dark matter. And you'll see later uh, what that means, filtering dark matter. So let's start with phase transitions. Um, what's shown here is a phase transition um, that all of you know. It's the most common one in our everyday life, namely the transition of water from the liquid phase uh, to the gas phase. Um, <clears throat> here is the physicist's view of that phase transition. That's the phase diagram of water. The horizontal axis here is the temperature. The vertical axis is the pressure. You see the three phases, ice, water, and uh, water vapor. And uh, the thick lines indicate at which temperature and pressure the various transitions happen. So for instance, if you look here, at uh, uh, atmospheric pressure, then as you reach zero degrees, you have a transition from ice to water and then to gas. So that's uh, a plot all seen and that you've probably all tested in your lab courses as an undergraduate. Um, but a phase transition is a more general concept. Um, and we are here going to focus in particular about phase transitions that happen in cosmology. Now, one very important quantity when we talk about phase transitions is the so-called order parameter. So in a phase transition, some property of a system changes abruptly. And the order parameter is a quantity that quantifies this change in the system. So depending on the phase transition, that'll be a different quantity. And typically it's not unique, but for the liquid gas transition, a suitable order parameter could be the density of the substance. For the QCD phase transition, so the transition where um, the universe uh, goes from a phase of where quarks are free to a phase where quarks are confined in hadrons. Um, for that phase transition, a suitable parameter is the quark condensate. So the expectation value 
of the field combination Q bar left, Q right. And for the electroweak phase transition, a suitable order parameter is the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs field. Now, here is um, a typical picture for how the energy of a system evolves as a function of the order parameter and as a function of the temperature. So the horizontal axis here is the order parameter, the vertical axis is some measure of energy. And in this scenario that I've shown here, at high temperatures, the behavior is such that the lowest energy state is at order parameter zero. It doesn't need to be zero, but at some particular value of the order parameter. So that's where the system is going to sit at high temperature. Then as the temperature drops, we see that this potential develops a second minimum away from zero. And eventually that second minimum becomes deeper than the original one. And you also notice that there is a barrier between the two. So the system uh, will eventually tunnel through that barrier and jump from the previous false vacuum state here at zero to the true vacuum state that is at a larger value of the order parameter. Now, this is what we call a first order transition. A first order transitions are characterized by a discontinuous change in the order parameter. So for instance, if this was the electroweak phase transition, then this would mean that the Higgs VEF abruptly changes from zero to a non-zero value. So here's a, a typical a diagram of, of what the behavior of the order parameter looks like. So the, the important feature here is the discontinuity. This needs to be contrasted with second order transitions or higher order transitions up to a, a crossover where the order parameter changes continuously. The difference is that here, as the new minimum in the potential forms, um, there is no barrier between the old and the new minimum. So the order parameter um, smoothly evolves from its original value to its new value. And that's, for instance, what the electroweak phase transition is like in the standard model. So there is still a, dra a dramatic change in the system over a relatively narrow range of temperatures, but it is a continuous transition. Now, let's put all of this uh, to good use for dark matter physics. The first scenario I want to talk about here is dark matter decay between phase transitions. Now, what does that mean? Let's start again with the freeze out picture that I've shown in the beginning of my talk. Um, what this picture shows is that in order to explain the observed abundance of dark matter, we need a mechanism that depletes dark matter by several orders of magnitude compared to the abundance of a, a relativistic particle in equilibrium. But then that mechanism has to stop. So at some point, the dark matter needs to stop being depleted. Now, in the most standard dark matter scenarios, that is achieved via annihilation. But why can't it be decay? Now, obviously, we don't want dark matter to decay today, because if dark matter was decaying today uh, at a high rate, then none of it would be left. And that would be in gross violation of observations. So the idea is that phase transitions, uh, that there is a phase transition that stops the dark matter decay. That's possible because phase transitions can break symmetries. Phase transitions can shift the masses of particles, both the, the, the wef induced masses and the thermal corrections to those masses. And therefore a phase transition has the potential of making dark matter unstable, either by breaking a symmetry that stabilizes dark matter or by changing the kinematics of the model in such a way that decays that were previously forbidden are now allowed or vice versa. So the scenario that I want to uh, present in the next couple of slides is one where we start with stable dark matter, a phase transition happens to make it unstable and the second phase transition restores that stability. Now, so we need those two phase transitions and it turns out that that is what you find quite naturally in perhaps the simplest extension of the standard model, namely just add a singlet scalar. If you add a singlet scalar to the standard model, the scalar potential looks like this. There are the quadratic and quartic terms for the standard model Higgs, the quadratic and quartic terms for the new scalar and a Higgs portal coupling through which the two fields communicate with each other. Now at very high temperatures, um, this potential receives large thermal corrections. So thermal loop diagrams um, affect this potential and they affect it in such a way that they dramatically increase the effective values of the quadratic terms. That means the potential is essentially parabolic and both of the valves, the new one and the standard model one are at zero. Then at some lower temperature, um, the thermal corrections will first become small in the dark sector because the dark sector typically contains fewer particles than the standard model. So there's fewer loop diagrams and therefore fewer 
uh, uh, thermal correctness. Of course, it's a parameter dependent statement, but that's the general picture. So that means the dark sector potential will start to get dominated by its tree level potential. And with the sign choice that I've made up here, this means that the new scalar will develop a vacuum expectation value. The standard model Higgs is still at web zero. Now at even lower temperatures, um, the system will uh, also lose the thermal corrections in the standard model sector. The standard model Higgs will develop a VEF, but now through this Higgs portal coupling, the standard model Higgs VEF feeds back into the quadratic term of the scalar. So effectively, depending on the sign of the lambda p parameter, it can switch off the VEF of the scalar. So this is why we call it VEF flip-flop because the VEF changes from being in the scalar sector to being in the standard model sector. So here's a video of this. I hope this comes through through Zoom. Um, the two axes here on the bottom are the standard model Higgs VEF and the new scalar VEF. And this uh, shape here, that's the potential. The red dot is the point where the universe is residing at any given moment. So you see here the potential develops. The universe jumps into the uh, vacuum where the scalar, the new scalar has a VEF. Then at some point, two new minima develop along the standard model Higgs direction and the universe jumps over there. And this is where it still is today. So with this behavior, um, we can do some very simple model building. Basically we take this scalar, we add a dark matter particle. And for the particular case that I'm showing here, we are also adding an auxiliary fermion into which the dark matter is decaying. Uh, possibly that auxiliary fermion could be one of the standard model fermions. But um, I won't go into the details of the model here. I have a backup slide on this, but here's the behavior that we find for the dark matter abundance. So that's once again, cosmological time versus dark matter abundance. The dashed curve here is the would-be thermal relic abundance, uh, the would-be thermal abundance. Here, however, the dark matter cannot annihilate. So its abundance stays constant until the first phase transition happens. Then it rapidly begins to decay <coughs> until eventually those decays are switched off and the dark matter abundance is frozen. And this is then what sets the abundance today. So <clears throat> what you can notice here, the dark matter needs to be relatively weakly coupled because the decay here is competing with the Hubble rate, which is relatively small. But these couplings, that may not be unnatural given that dark matter is in a dark sector. So the couplings between the, of the dark sector to the rest of the model are expected to be small. <coughs> um, here is a plot of the parameter space where this works best. So this pixelated region here in the middle, this is the region of parameter space where this mechanism works best. In other regions of the parameter space, um, the scalar potential may not have the behavior we want. For instance, the scalar might have a VEF today, there might be no electric symmetry breaking or the scalar might never get a VEF. So this gives you an idea that this is a mechanism that doesn't work everywhere in parameter space, of course, but there's a sizable chunk in parameter space. And I should say at this stage that we are not the first ones to consider this particular parameter region. So this is a very common uh, occurrence in, electri in electric barrier genesis models, for instance. <clears throat> okay, now I promised you two mechanisms of using phase transitions to set the dark matter abundance. So here's the second one. Um, I'm now going to explain what I meant by the term filtered dark matter. So let's once again, consider the phase transition of water to water vapor. One of the salient features of that phase transition is that it, it proceeds by the formation of gas bubbles in the liquid phase. So um, um, we start forming gas in some places and then those bubbles grow until eventually all the water has evaporated. And that's similar to what happens in cosmology. So a cosmological first order phase transition also proceeds via the nucleation of bubbles of the true vacuum in a universe that is still in the false vacuum. I'm now going to show you an animation. Once again, I'm not sure this comes through via Zoom uh, in the correct way. If not, I'm also going to tell you what you see. So what you see here is you see the initial, the, the starting point of that simulation um, with uh, two bubbles having formed here, still being relatively small, but most of the universe still being in the false vacuum indicated here by this uh, light brown color. Now, as we start the simulation, those bubbles are beginning to expand. There are new bubbles forming. Eventually the bubbles start to collide um, and there's more and more bubbles. They get bigger and bigger until eventually the whole universe is filled um, with 
the blue phase means the, meaning the universe has now completed the transition. There are still some wobbling going around, so there are still some reverberations in the plasma, um, meaning sound waves and turbulence, for instance. But uh, essentially, the universe is now in the new vacuum state, in the true vacuum state. Now, <clears throat> let's ask the question, what's happening at these bubble walls? So as you, as you saw, the phase transition uh, is proceeding by the expansion of those bubbles. Um, so let's talk about the dynamics of those. And uh, to bring dark matter into the picture, we are going to assume that dark matter feels the effect of the phase transition by coupling to the scalar field that's responsible for the phase transition. So we imagine that in this phase transition, some scalar particle acquires a VEF that can be the standard model Higgs or can be a new scalar and the dark matter couples to that scalar. That means that in the phase transition, the dark matter particle either acquires a mass or at least is, its mass changes in the phase transition. And that's the feature that we are going to exploit. Yeah, hold on. Sorry, means... to, sorry to interrupt, you have 10 minutes left until Perfect. the end Thank of the total time. Perfect, thank you. Um, so if the dark matter inside those bubbles is heavier than the dark matter outside those bubbles, this means that not all dark matter particles will be able to enter because as they cross the bubble, well, they have to take that energy from somewhere to get a mass. So they must hit the bubble wall already with a sufficient energy. If they have insufficient energy, they will just be reflected and remain uh, in the unbroken phase of the symmetry outside the bubbles. And therefore, only the dark matter particles that are in the tails of the thermal distribution will be able to enter those bubbles. And the larger this Yukawa coupling here is, so the larger the mass is that the dark matter acquires as it enters the bubbles, um, the more we will be pushed out into the tails. <clears throat> so here's, an, here's a, a more complete picture of the scenario we have in mind. You see here on the right-hand side in blue, this is the bubble in which the phase transition has already happened. Here on the left-hand side in light brown or light orange or whatever you want to call that color, you have the phase in which the phase transition has not yet happened. The bubble wall is this line here and the bubble, is assumed, the bubble wall is assumed to be moving to the left in this plot. Um, now we're assuming here that outside the bubble, the dark matter is strictly massless. That doesn't have to be, but it's the simplest case. So outside the bubble, it's strictly massless and the scalar strictly doesn't have a VEF, whereas inside the bubble, the scalar has a VEF and the dark matter has a mass, which we here take to be a larger than the temperature of the phase transition. So in that case, outside the bubble, the dark matter can annihilate efficiently. Inside the bubble, annihilation is forbidden because it proceeds via the T-channel exchange of a now very heavy particle. So it's just, uh, it's just like dark matter instantaneously freezes out as it enters the bubble. And okay, the five particles, we assume those to still be in contact with the standard model, for instance, via our Higgs portal coupling. Um, so that means that dark matter that rests outside the bubble is depleted rather efficiently via annihilation. And dark matter particles that enter the bubbles, um, they decouple from the cosmological evolution and stay there until the present day. So in other words, the bubble wall will be pushing lots of dark matter particles ahead of it. So ahead of the bubble wall, the dark matter density will be larger than the equilibrium density, and this will only enhance annihilation. And thereby, most of the dark matter will efficiently annihilate away in front of the bubble wall. Only a small fraction of it will enter. And this is also written here on my slides. Okay, so once again, the basic idea is only the dark matter particles from the tail of the thermal distribution can enter the bubble. And because the tail of the thermal distribution is exponentially suppressed, this leads to an exponential suppression of the dark matter abundance. That's exactly what we need to explain the abundance we observed today. Um, here you can see a picture in phase space, so the horizontal axis here is uh, the spatial coordinate orthogonal to the bubble wall. Um, the vertical axis is the momentum. So you see here the various particle trajectories, the ones from the tails of the distribution at large momenta can enter the bubble, the ones at small momenta get reflected. And the shading here indicates the relative overdensity of dark matter relative to the thermal abundance. Um, so this shows clearly that you have this overdensity in front of the wall. Now here's a, for, for a, uh, the simplest model of this type, here's a parameter space plot. Um, I probably won't have time to explain all the features. Um, we can do that offline if you wish. Um, but this, the plane which we are plotting here is the plane of the dark matter nucleon cross section. So that's the familiar 
plane from dark matter direct detection, and we've shown the corresponding limits here. And uh, the important feature is here that this mechanism uh, works particularly well for relatively heavy dark matter. So we are here um, in a regime where dark matter has a mass of maybe 10 TeV or a PeV or so. That is a mass range that is not reachable with uh, more conventional uh, dark matter uh, freeze out mechanisms because they suffer from the greased Kamionkowski bound. Here we have a mechanism that naturally works for heavy dark matter. And in that region, I think it's, it's a totally, un, not totally, but very much unexplored region of dark matter parameter space. And so far, there's not that many mechanisms that can set the correct relic abundance in this mass range. And so, well, here is a mechanism that does it. Not the only one, but, but it's a new one. Okay, <clears throat> now let's, uh, let me spend one more slide on further implications of this type of scenarios. Um, so the first thing is that one of the features I had in most of these models is that there's a Higgs portal coupling at some level. That's not only true for the two scenarios that I showed you here, it's true for most scenarios in which the dark matter abundance is set by a phase transition. And now Higgs portal couplings are testable at colliders. If the new scalar is uh, lighter than half the Higgs mass, um, the best channel to probe it is obviously invisible Higgs decays. If the new scalar has a vacuum expectation value, then uh, it will generically mix with the Higgs. And so it can leave traces in electric precision observables, in modified Higgs branching ratios, or even in we might be able to directly observe the new scalar. And finally, uh, precision measurements of Higgs self-coupling, such as in di-Higgs production, could set some constraints on, on this type of couplings, but that's really for the future. This is nothing we can do today. Um, moreover, first order phase transitions emit gravitational waves. So one, one could explore whether there are suitable signals there. I should say that um, at the models that I presented here, we looked into this and it turns out there are gravitational wave signals, but they are too weak to be observable by say LISA or so. And finally, I already alluded to electric barrier genesis, which also invokes phase transitions in the early universe to solve one of the big problems of cosmology. And so there could be some interesting synergies here, which is something that we are exploring at the moment. So this brings me to my summary. Um, the take home message I wanted to send here was that uh, the physics that happens at phase transitions is an interesting way to set the dark matter abundance in the early universe. I've told you here about dark matter filtering and dark matter decay. There are some mechanisms of modified freeze-in, for instance, that I've not talked about here, and there are other mechanisms. If this is indeed what's happening in the early universe, then uh, it might have interesting consequences um, also in, in experiments that we are doing today. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, thank you for your attention, and I'm, I'm happy to answer questions in the remaining like uh, two or three minutes or so. Thank you very much, Joaquin, for the very nice talk. So if uh, I would suggest that if anybody has uh, any question, please come forward. We still have uh, three minutes. So as we wait, uh, can I ask you a curiosity? Would you go, go back uh, to the, the mechanism of filtered dark matter? There is a slide in which you show also the, thick, uh, the thickness of the wall of the bubble. Ah, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so how, how much does this uh, quantity uh, affect the, the final result of your computation? Is, is it an essential quantity, the thickness or? No, no. no. The, the, the thickness of the bubble wall is not really essential here. Um, what's most important is um, the, the mass shift between the region inside the bubble and the region outside the bubble. I see. So the, the, the requirement is that uh, the dark matter inside the bubble is substantially heavier than the temperature of the phase transition. That means that either the scalar field gets a VEF that is somewhat larger than the temperature of the phase transition or that the Yukawa coupling of the dark matter to the scalar is relatively large. Yeah, I see. I see. But the, the thickness of the wall is not, not really a crucial quantity here. So basically, even if the wall is very large, uh, it will go either it gets through or not. Exactly, yeah. I see a question right. by Matthias. Yes, there is, there is a, so Matthias, please come forward. Yeah, hello, hi, Joaquin. Um, uh, I was curious about the low mass regime. So could you 
maybe spare a few words on why does this work for heavier dark matter and why it gets more difficult as I go to lower masses? The filter dark matter mechanism, oh yeah. So the problem at low dark matter masses is um, that you need a way of getting rid of the dark matter in front of the bubble wall, right? This only works if the dark matter that cannot enter the bubble is somehow annihilated away. <clears throat> and since the only way, the only uh, uh, portal through which the dark matter is coupled to the standard model here is the Higgs portal. This means that if this happens at too low a temperature, then we have to go through the Higgs couplings to the light particles of the standard model. And then we are suppressed by Yukawa couplings. Oh, here in this very heavy regime, we can directly annihilate into Higgs bosons basically. Um, and so, so that's very favorable. And th then, so that's why it doesn't work here on the very left. And then there is this region here in between. Um, there it's, it's uh, even more intricate. There in principle, the mechanism works but it turns out that the Higgs portal coupling that we need together with uh, the VEF of the known VEF of the standard model Higgs and the VEF of the, the scalar field that is constrained by the other parameters, we can't get the correct standard model Higgs mass out, right? There are two scalars, they have a mass matrix, they mix with each other. We need that mixing to be relatively small. We need to get the correct Higgs mass out and these constraints on the Higgs potential, they exclude this, this wedge of parameter space here between the two purple regions. Okay, so uh, actually, this is all feature of the Higgs portal models, I guess. I, that's, I that's true. Yeah, that's. That, I assume maybe some variations of these models may work at. Uh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Great. So unfortunately, we ran out of time. I see that there is a, another question from Alexis. So I, I, Alexis, I encourage you to send a message directly to Joaquim for your question. Sure. At the end of the session, we may have time. Uh, to, to answer it and, and to ask him directly, but I'm, let, let's see, I'm, I'm not completely sure. So Joaquin, thanks, you, th thanks a lot for the very, very nice talk and for accepting our Thank invitation. You. It was a pleasure. So I think we can move on to Tim. Hi, Tim. Hello, thank you. Let me just share okay. my screen again. So you're gonna have 25 minutes. I'm gonna give you a warning after 50. Thank you very much, Enrico. So uh, yes, it's very nice to be here. Of course, it would be much nicer to actually be there. Uh, and I hope that there will be some chance to do that again soon. Uh, I'm gonna say a little bit today about uh, an early period of QCD for WIMP, uh, for QCD confinement for WIMP freeze out. Um, this is some work that uh, continues a line of work, but the most recent thing, the one that the most of the meat of this talk is about uh, is based on this paper from earlier this year uh, with uh, Dylan Berger, Shada Epek, and Michael Waterbury. And I should point out that the two graduate students, uh, Berger and Waterbury, really did very well. And if, if you're looking for a postdoc, there are some names that you should maybe keep in mind. So the outline, uh, the motivation here is going to be to explore novel cosmologies. Actually, in many ways, this talk is very similar, using similar ingredients to the ones that Joachim was invoking in his talk just a moment ago. In fact, almost all of the ingredients are there. They're just kind of reshuffled in an interesting way. And I, I very much appreciated uh, seeing that. Um, so in particular, I'll talk about an early period of QCD confinement. And because this is kind of a radical change in cosmology and uh, particle physics, I'll need to spend a little bit of time talking about how to actually implement that. Then I'll get to the subject that's more relevant for what we're talking about today. That is dark matter freeze out. Uh, so then I'll, I'll go through that uh, uh, then and finish up with some outlook, which contains also some phenomenology. And we'll see if we really have time for that. So um, first, some introduction. Um, the, basically, the invitation to this is to think about what we, can, what we know about early cosmology, what we could imagine might be different from our expectations, uh, and you know, how that might change the way that we think about problems um, and opportunities in particle physics. So of course, you know, this is a, a cartoon of energy scales in the universe. Uh, so as the temperature falls, we move from the left to the right. Um, the things at the bottom, um, like the CMB and BBN, are pretty well understood things that pretty much anchor our understanding of the physics and the cosmology, uh, both pretty well from MEV temperatures uh, downward. Now above BBN, things get much more hazy because we just don't have very good probes at the moment. Uh, that tell us about what's going on in the universe at those times. We think that there was a QCD phase transition or QCD deconfined around a GEV scale. 
Uh, and of course, um, we think that the electroweak uh, symmetry went through a phase transition around 100 GeV where it was restored. Uh, that, that's part of what Joachim was uh, talking about. And then at the same time, we have some ideas for things that should have been happening, some processes that we think are likely like baryogenesis. We know we have to get a baryon asymmetry somewhere. Uh, and maybe the dark matter froze out if it's a wimp. Um, I'm going to assume that it is actually, and um, so that will be something that I'll be talking about. But the real point is that before BBN, we really didn't actually know that we don't have any direct probes as to what the universe is really doing. So we don't really know what it was. So, you know, the way the ancient cartographers would show this on a map is by putting a dragon to say, I don't know what goes here. So here there'd be dragons. Um, this year, we actually are dealing with a dragon of a different sort. Uh, and um, well, it seems like we're finally learning how to slay this one too. So, um, so specifically today, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus on the somewhat radical idea that QCD had a very different coupling in early times. So it's a, a model basically where the coupling changes with time or with the properties. And the coupling is so different that QCD actually confines at that time, which may be around sort of a TeV or 100 GeV, um, with a confinement scale much larger than the one GeV of the standard model. And then of course, before we get to BBN, it has to relax back into something that looks like the standard model, you know, with its standard lambda QCD, which I'm gonna say is about a GeV or so. And for my purposes, being more precise than that isn't very important. Um, of course, I could imagine more modest modifications to the coupling that would just maybe tweak its value a little bit. This has also been looked at in the context of, say, electric baryogenesis by these authors. Um, so you might ask yourself, why is it that you want to do the radical thing first? And I think the real answer is because it's fun. And it seems like that also gives me some profit. So why not? You can play similar games with other parts of the standard model, like SU2E, and get an even weirder universe than the one that I'm going to describe. Um, but I'm not going to have time to go into that today. So let's talk about what it means to have QCD confine or go through a period of early confinement in the universe. So the basic idea is that I introduced some dynamics that promotes the strong coupling into a dynamical field. And uh, unfortunately it's denoted by either phi or S depending on which collaboration I was part of at the time. Here it's phi. So the idea is we have the standard kinetic term for the gluons, uh, but there's some interaction with a scalar field phi. It's a higher dimensional interaction. So it's characterized by a coupling constant with dimensions of mass. I wrote that this one over M star. And the point is when phi gets a VEV, the effective strong coupling constant is shifted away from what it would have been without that VEV. So the effective coupling of the strong force is, is modified in the presence of this maximum expectation value. Uh, now, I'm not gonna be very concerned with what exactly phi is. It could be something like a diloton or a radion in a theory with extra dimensions. Um, it could also have a coupling induced radiatively. So it would just be some scalar field that talks to gluons through a loop diagram like this one, maybe through some vector like quarks. The parameter G0 is the strong coupling in the absence of a phi bev, and it runs just like an ordinary QCD. So we can actually use that fact to understand how and when um, the theory would confine in the presence of a phi bev as well. So at one loop, we can include the running. Um, and again, this is easily done as one over alpha, right? One over alpha runs linearly. So um, one over alpha effective then is thus given by the bare value of one over alpha, um, the one loop corrections to it, which take the standard form and um, assuming ordinary standard model QCD, I would just plug in the number of quarks, which I'll assume is six because I'm at some high energy where the top quark is active. Uh, and then there's also the correction that comes from um, the phi bev. So then turning this around and asking when does this coupling become strong and therefore where does QCD confine, um, this actually can then be related to the parameter uh, lambda zero where QCD would have confined otherwise and then there's an exponential dependence on the VEV of phi. So in general, I'm gonna call this exponential C uh, and I'll just sort of, sort of parameterize my theory by what, what C uh, is, you know, how much bigger than ordinary QCD uh, the early confinement looks like. So if I wanted this confinement to happen at around a TeV scale, and if I had six active flavors of quarks, like in the standard model, then I would need that the change in the VEV of, of uh, phi from the early times to the late times uh, over this scale is something of order minus 0.8 or so. So this pushes the EFT a little bit, but actually, um, and, and it was induced radiatively, it would require about 10 vector-like quarks whose masses are at M star, which is kind of a lot. Uh, on the other hand, actually nothing would go very wrong if I moved out of the EFT description. And so in principle, there's really you know no, ob no obstacle to actually um, implementing this. Um, this little cartoon down here shows you what you can imagine. So the temperature now is going from low to high. So right, so time is kind of moving from 
the right side towards the left side. Um, and you can see for different values of the VEV of phi, which is written as the VEV of S, V sub S, um, right? So there's the ordinary confinement that would happen if there's no VEV around a GEV or so. Uh, and you can see for different values of the VEV over M star, uh, we get a confinement that say maybe around 20 or 30 GEV, or this one is like sort of around 300 GEV or so. So there's still a lot of things that have to be implemented in order to make this work. Um, the potential for this scalar has to have some temperature dependent corrections um, such that the VEVIFY shifts from high temperatures to low temperatures. Um, and that of course is um, something that we've got to implement into the particle physics of the model, right? So the idea is that initially there's some value for the VEVIFY phi one, this leads to lambda around the TEV uh, it's controlled, of course, by the uh, potential of for phi as a function of temperature. So at high temperatures, it's uh, favoring this kind of minimum. At low temperatures, there's a shift where it goes to a different VEV that I call phi zero, and that leads to lambda moving down uh, to GeV. And of course, exactly how we go from one to the other is going to depend is going to determine what happens in the universe during that time. If you imagine it's a fairly sudden shift that happens early on, you could imagine that you are confined at around the TeV scale, then your potential changes such that lambda QCD um, you know, falls down to its standard model value. At that point, the universe deconfines. So everything up here was very massive um, hadrons. It becomes quarks and gluons again. But then as the universe cools, eventually you get to the point where you go through the QCD phase transition in the ordinary way that the standard model experiences. And so it reconfines into the um, hadrons that we see today with the masses that we see today. And I'll talk a little bit about what the physics is up here in the confined scale. I'm not gonna actually be very wedded to any particular picture for how this uh, proceeds. So um, I'm not gonna need those details. So you can imagine very different ways to obtain the appropriate thermal corrections to the phi potential. Uh, in fact, Joachim just sort of went over some of them so we can go through this quickly. So for example, there could be some no, new fields, maybe call them psi with order one couplings to phi and masses around the TeV scale. In fact, when I get to the WIMP um, discussion in just a few minutes, um, they could be those fields actually. Um, at temperatures around their masses, the corrections become exponentially suppressed. And so we may go from a point where they have uh, given us <clears throat> symmetry restoration. So a VEV that's uh, at zero at the high temperatures, uh, down at low temperatures, we may see that the underlying potential for phi comes through uh, and we um, may have a, um, a minimum at a different point. And this of course looks a lot like a cartoon of what the Higgs potential in the standard model does. Um, these new fermions have to couple to phi and they have to have masses around the TeV scale, but they don't have to be SU3 charged or electroweakly charged. LHC bounds on them are probably not very strong. And, and as I just said, they could actually be the dark matter. Um, of course, they are very important for the ph phenomenology of phi and they could play an important role in its decays and so forth. So um, another option that one could imagine, so this is sort of in, in parallel to that idea before, would be to use the fact that I can write down Higgs portal interactions between um, my field phi and the standard model of Higgs. So now phi has changed into S. So these are the, uh, the singlet field that gives QCD its coupling is now S. It has some potential, but there are also cross terms that allow it to communicate with the standard model Higgs. Um, and this leads to sort of a complicated multi-field dynamic where you're breaking both the electric symmetry and also um, changing the value of the singlet phi at the same time. Uh, and that's happening because the Higgs potential is itself evolving with temperature and its evolution could trigger a switch in the singlet potential to a new minimum. Um, now, since this picture requires a balance between the singlet and the Higgs potentials, it really requires that the uh, change in the VEV of phi be on the order of the electroweak scale or else uh, the Higgs potential is not gonna be able to make a big enough uh, effect onto the, the potential. So the picture you can imagine is something like you start off down here where there's a VEV for the singlet, but there's no VEV for the Higgs. As the Higgs potential evolves, uh, you actually move in this field space uh, to a point where there's a VEV for both the singlet and the Higgs. But then as the Higgs gets a, a um, a VEV, it actually through these terms and the potential influences the potential for the singlet such that we then move to the standard model like vacuum where which has a QCD like value of lambda QCD, uh, and standard model like I should say, uh, and also fully broken electric symmetry. So we studied this actually in great deal, great detail in this paper with um, Jessica Howard, uh, Juna Kroon, and uh, Shiva Epek. 
Um, I'm not going to go through the cartoon, sort of the snapshots of what the potential looked like in detail, but it, it does what you want it to do. Uh, it actually goes from a point where you have a minimum where you want it, and then you roll down eventually to the standard model. So let's say a little bit about the QCD phase transition. Um, this first high scale transition takes place at high temperatures before the electric symmetry breaking, and thus it has massless quarks. There are very old arguments from Wilczek and Bizarski that, are, that say that for six massless flavors, as you have in the standard model, this is expected to be a first order phase transition, unlike in the standard model where it's actually a crossover phase transition. So it's again, more like some of the transitions that Joachim was describing. Um, where you have a conf the combined vacuum forms via bubble, nu bubble nucleation. And as he also mentioned, the order parameter, right, is the breaking of chiral symmetry or the expectation value of Q bar Q. Now, this order parameter also breaks the electroweak symmetry, and the condensate acts as a tadpole for the Higgs, inducing an, a vacuum expectation value for it. So it also breaks the electroweak symmetry. And in fact, this is what I would call old school technicolor for those who know what that word means. Um, the idea of the electric symmetry might actually get contributions from some strongly confined force. Of course, there is also a standard model Higgs in this picture, so it's actually something like what used to be called bosonic technicolor. Tim, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. You have 10 minutes left. Perfect. I'm almost <laughs> to the point. Uh, yeah. So here's a cartoon of how this happens. I have, you know, three quarks and gluons out here with no Higgs VEV. I form a vacuum of the true, I form a bubble of the true vacuum. There's a condensate uh, for Q bar Q of order lambda QCD cubed, and that also induces the non-zero Higgs bar. Um, so there's just one last thing I have to talk about before I can actually get to the dark matter. Um, in the confined phase, the important degrees of freedom are the 35 uh, pseudo nambro goldstone bosons. Their properties are described by chiral perturbation theory, but with six flavors and with parameters that are scaled up to the high confinement scale. So in the effect of Lagrangian, right, where we have, say, for example, the term that usually gave masses to the mesons, um, that is the term for the quark masses, which thus gave masses to the mesons, um, there are parameters like this kappa um, and f pi. These all get scaled up by an appropriate power of xi. So the pion masses effectively actually get scaled up both by the new value of the Higgs VEV uh, and the scaled up lambda QCD. <laughs> There are thermal corrections to the Higgs potential that are dominated by the top or, or bottom flavored meson, depending on their masses. And as I mentioned, the chiral condensate acts as a tadpole for the Higgs doublet. And you can see that by just taking the usual term in chiral perturbation theory, it gives you masses for the pions and including the Higgs field dependence uh, and there's the tadpole. So here's the two example uh, pion spectrums for different values of C, one where QCD is scaled up by 500 or 1000. And you can see that you get sort of particles and masses ranging from 10-ish GeV, right? Those are like the ordinary pions with up and down quarks up to about a TeV, and those are the pions that contain the top quark. Um, computing the thermal corrections of the Higgs potential, you actually have a picture where when QCD confines, um, so in say the orange curve that happens around 400 GeV, the Higgs VEV um, actually gets bumped up to around 400 or 500 GeV, it evolves slowly with time. And then of course, when deconfinement happens, it goes down to its standard model value. So, okay, let's finally get to talk about WIMP freeze out in the last few minutes. Um, so let's imagine there is a WIMP-like particle, which is a standard model singlet, a Dirac fermion, and it likes to interact with quarks. So in other words, I write down some interaction between my dark matter, which is now written as chi, uh, and two quarks. So I write this as a dimension six operator just because I'm lazy and I don't want to have a UV theory, but of course this could be written down with a scalar mediator very easily. And then there's some couplings beta, which uh, parameterize what flavors of quarks the dark matter likes to couple to. Um, and I'm just going to assume that beta scales like the Yukawa couplings. Um, this is actually um, uh, something that obeys minimal flavor violation. So that allows me to avoid some of the most ferocious constraints on flavor violation. Um, from you know, the measurements um, and it's consistent with the Higgs portal. So in other words, this is uh, an idea that you could generate by having the singlet field be heavy and having some mixing with the Higgs, which we just saw is likely. Um, this is the kind of low energy interaction that it would mediate with the dark matter. It would look something like this. So then I take my quark level operator and I map it into um, the term in the chiral Lagrangian. So it's got the same values of kappa, and, uh, and then when I expand out my U, which contains the pion field, it'll have F pi, and I can then compute actually what the interactions of the dark matter with the pions are so that I can look at the freeze out during the time of early confinement. 
So that then if I expand it out into the actual pion field, um, I get three terms from this, I get, sorry, two terms from this interaction, which are very interesting. The first one is actually uh, just something that looks like a constant times uh, chi bar chi. So in other words, what this tells you is that the dark matter interacts with quarks in this way, then when QCD confines, it gives a contribution to the dark matter mass. Uh, and this is again, sort of the strongly coupled analog of what the opening is showing us. Then there are also interactions with the pions as well. So the pion, uh, the condensate shifts the dark matter mass by some amount delta m, uh, and you can compute how large that is. And then you have the interactions which are related to, to the pions. So, okay, what does this do? Um, if I look at the annihilation cross-section, you can see for uh, these two, the green values are two different values of my coupling. Remember, small, larger values of mass are weaker couplings. Um, you can see a threshold. So the solid curve is just the standard model case with this interaction, assuming there's no early confinement. Um, you can see there's a threshold at the top quark, right? Because I assume that my coupling scale with the uh, Kawa couplings. And then when I go to the early confined phase, there's an enhancement of the interactions because of the confinement scale. And I see that I get much larger cross sections. So obviously if you're freezing out during this period, it makes a very big difference because you have a very different cross section. And that's reflected in the smaller curve by the different freeze up temperature. Uh, and then of course, I, in the standard way, I can map those cross sections into the relic abundance. So again, in the standard model for these values of the coupling constant, you would have had a dark matter particle that is way too overabundant. Um, that's the solid green and blue curves. Uh, but now going to freeze out during early confinement and raising and you know enhancing the interactions with the pions, this actually leads to places where you could actually realize the relic abundance that you want. So then turning that around, this is as a function of the dark matter mass at zero temperature, right? So remember there's a shift during the time of, of freeze out as well. This is the interaction strength that I would need in order to generate the correct relic abundance. And that's shown as the solid curve for the standard model like case, and then the dashed and dotted curves for the early confined cases. There's a question of the sign of the interaction, which either raises or lowers the dark matter mass. And that's why there are two colors here for the dashed and dotted lines. Um, and also remember that as I go to smaller MS, that's actually stronger interactions. So the interesting thing here is that if you see the dark matter, it um, it would have been completely excluded by xenon one ton for these masses because the interaction strength to realize the relic density into quarks uh, would be completely ruled out. It's just too strong. Whereas for early confinement, I need weaker interactions. And right, and today what matters is the uh, deconfined uh, case where these interactions are no longer enhanced. So xenon would actually not be able to see anything. And so this is a nice way to maybe realize um, how to reconcile the searches for uh, dark matter that have been unsuccessful so far with having a thermal relic just by changing the cosmology in this way. So um, just one quick point before I conclude, um, the situation is very different if I have a, a minimal flavor violating vector interaction. There, there's no large enhancement and basically there's no big difference in the predictions. So it does matter that I have a scalar interaction for this. So I have a few slides you can go through at your leisure about the phenomenology of the singlet to see what you could look at for colliders. Uh, this is an out of time. I'll just conclude by saying, I played with the idea that QCD may have gone through early confinement. It's fun, it's interesting, it's worth investigating. I highlighted an application uh, in terms of rescuing WIMP dark matter that would have otherwise been ruled out by direct searches. I didn't have time to discuss the baryon asymmetry, but you can read about that in our papers. There's also a nice model of baryogenesis here. Um, and you can also imagine applications to axion cosmology uh, as well to uh, influence the, the axion abundance. And you can read about that soon, I'm hoping. So I see this as part of a larger program where we should understand the space of what is possible in the early universe and how to constrain that space. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim, for the very, very nice talk. So we have a couple of minutes for questions. If, uh, if somebody has questions, uh, come forward, please. I do have one. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. So Tim, uh, so if the annihilation cross-section, it can be actually larger, uh, wouldn't it be any implications for, for instance, indirect detection searches? Not really. So what happens actually is that at the time you freeze out your interaction, your annihilation cross-section is very much enhanced. But then between then and now, QCD deconfines, QC goes back to normal. And so that cross-section actually goes back down to a sort of WIMP-like cross-section. In fact, because you know, I have to raise it up to a WIMP-like level when I freeze out, it therefore goes very low into, uh, 
a much suppressed interaction. And so it's a lot like the direct detection searches. In fact, I'm sorry, I didn't, uh, I, we have some comments about this in our paper, but we didn't, uh, I didn't show them because they're subdominant for the direct searches. But it's a similar story where you rescue yourself from basically any kind of particle probe because fundamentally your, your particle just, you know, more weakly interacting. Okay. I don't see any other questions. So let me let me just uh, ask you curiosity in the last 30 seconds. So I guess the first phase transition will produce also gravitational waves, right? That's right. Uh, oh, we, but... we did actually look into that. Yeah. It's very hard to predict though, because the two effective theories for QCD fail precisely at the moment of confinement, right? right. The, the quarks and gluons are strongly coupled there and so are the pions. So we couldn't really believe what we were finding, but there's a first order phase transition and there's clearly some kind of signal, but is it visible? I don't actually know and I'm not sure anyone knows how to uh, simulate it right now. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Very good, so time is over. Thanks a lot, team, for the very, very nice talk. And uh, I think we can move on. So our next speaker is gonna be Farinaudo. So Farinado, you're gonna have uh, 20 minutes. Uh, I'm gonna give you a warning after 10. We, we can't hear you. You, I no. see. Okay, now yes, please. Can you see the, the slide? Yes. Okay, all right. So, so I'd like to first start the talk with two important messages to get across. I mean, first is one is that for all of those who are uh, attending this workshop is that we are building a community in Brazil. And I'd like to thank you very much, Fabio, Enrico, and Ivoni, especially Fabio for this, his effort for the past five years or so. He has been behind many events on dark matter, especially at, in Sao Paulo. And second, let's celebrate life. I mean, I know what, what we are all going through right now. And for instance, my second daughter was born in the middle of this pandemic. And I'm quite happy that she had some uh, health issues, but she's now fully recovered. So let's get started. So my talk will concern about light dark matter, the lithium problem and the, the Hubble, the h naught problem. So, <clears throat> so to, get, to have an idea, for instance, if we had these two, three, three great guys, for instance, Edwin would say that the Hubble rate's more important or Ralph, one of the fathers of the big, big band nuclear synthesis would say the lithium problem is more important. And perhaps Fritz would say they are not spherically, spherically not, not important compared to dark matter. But uh, I'll try to, during this talk, to make all of them happy. So I, I don't need, I guess, it's quite nice that I don't need to, <clears throat> to convince anyone the need for dark matter in our universe. So I'm just gonna skip this slide and go straight to Big Bang nuclear synthesis. So I have to admit that uh, I've studied Big Bang nuclear synthesis before many years ago, but I've never, never really paid attention to the lithium problem until I wrote this paper. <laughs> and <clears throat> as we know, the BBN is just one of the pillars of, of our universe, right? The way we see and understand our universe. And <clears throat> and has successful predictions. And I have to point out that the, the predictions we have, they do rely on something which is called baryonometer or the ratio between the baryon and the photon number densities. And one thing I would show you point out is that you see, if you see the green curve down below, which is the lithium prediction from BBN and this band that crosses from these three panels is the one inferred from CMB. So you, when you plug in the baryometer measured by BB, well, inferred from CMB data, you can see that the, for instance, the lithium abundance, the green curve is much higher, well, about a factor four higher than the yellow band. The yellow band, if you just extend it, would be the, the observed lithium abundance whereas the green band would be the BBN prediction and they are different. And that's this, for instance, the so-called lithium problem that has been around for over a decade. And, <clears throat> okay. And the other problem is more recent is the H not problem, which, well, actually is not that recent, but 
relatively speaking, yes. Uh, it has been around for around from 2007, I think. And <clears throat> what it's about is that current the local measurements differ from the measure, the value pointed by CMB data. So if CMB prefers the lower values for H0 compared to the local measurements, so there is a problem in H0. Well, depending on who you talk to, they say that it's not really a problem. It's just a, a matter of how we measure things. And there are lots of papers around that. So some of them saying that there's a trouble with H0, and some of them say, look, we can reconcile the local measurements with the the CMB inferred values, but usually is is there is a common agreement in the literature that at least a two sigma tension tension between these two values. So they can reach up to five sigma, depending on the kind of data you're assuming. Because we are talking about CMB data, therefore the the, the kind of data you use to infer the value for H not differs. So for instance, you can see in this picture, which is a paper from Rias, and Verde and Bernal, not the Nicholas Bernal who will talk about, who will give a talk today, another Bernal. Uh, <clears throat> so you can see in that plot, so there are different data sets being used and the values of H naught that differ from each other. So these are sort of account for what, are, what kind of values can we have for H naught depending on the value you use for it. And effective, and effective being the relativistic number of degrees of freedom. Well, relativistic degrees of freedom, which are related to the number of relativistic neutrino species we have. So, the point is, I want to make here is that the larger and effective, the larger H naught, roughly, right? So, the if you increase one, you increase the other. So, they are positively correlated. That's what I wanted to make. That's the point I wanted to make. Okay, so. I have the lithium problem, I have the H0 problem, and I have the problem, the dark matter problem, which I don't need to dwell on it. So the question we wanted to address is, was, uh, are they related somehow? So can we, can we make all those three great guys happy? So that's the point we wanted to make. So I'll have one, there are a few formulas in this talk, and one of them is, I guess this is the, the slide where I have more formulas to show, more equations to show. So we will have a mechanism where the dark matter is produced. Dark matter for me is this chi. So chi is the dark matter, which is produced, dark matter or a fraction of the dark matter abundance, which is produced from chi prime. So chi prime is a particle, is a long lived particle, which decays into chi and to gamma. So I, I want to, to highlight that this mechanism of having dark matter being, being produced from the decay of something has been around for, for many, many years. The only difference here is that we are trying to use this mechanism to tackle on three different things, dark matter, lithium, and the H0 problem. So this dark matter, if the mass difference between chi prime and chi is large, then this dark matter particle chi can be boosted. And we can use this boost of dark matter if it is relativistic. So you behave like radiation back then, therefore you contribute to an effective. So that's the idea. Having dark matter, so I have, I'm, for instance, I'm talking about one problem, which is the dark matter problem being boosted during some period of the universe. So I'm now, being, if it boosted and relativistic during some time, relativistic much before matter radiation quality, okay? So we don't want dark matter to be relativistic after matter radiation quality because of structure formation. But much before that it could be, and then it redshifts away and becomes non-relativistic non -relativistic later on. So, so chi prime decays into chi into gamma, and it's like a Bino gravitino in supersymmetry, something like that. So the other ways how you could, for instance, uh, implement this mechanism to some UV complete theories. Anyways, so you have chi, dark matter being produced from chi prime, the mass difference is large. So there is a boost factor involved. Knowing that the density of neutrinos 
can be written this way as a number of neutrinos. And knowing how the dark matter density scales with the scale factor, as, as we all know, is a matter, so it behaves with h minus three, a being the scale factor. So you, you can just relate these two quantities and realize that the matter radiation quality where the scale factor is around 10 to minus four. So you can re realize that one neutrino species correspond to 16% of the dark matter density at the matter radiation quality. Therefore, the, the, den the extra density resulted from this production mechanism of dark matter is just related to this scale, to this boost factor. So the dark matter which is produced through this mechanism will behave, will contribute like a neutrino given by this formula. All right, so <clears throat> if you take into account- sorry to, sorry to interrupt you, just to let you know that you are 10 minutes away from the end of your time. Okay, so I have plenty of time. So, <clears throat> so when you take into account the fact that the universe is expanding and, and that will shift the boost factor because this boost factor is the boost factor at decay when you take into account that the universe is expanding. So you have to include also as well the boost factor. And then you can determine what would be the change in an effective or the number of neutrinos we had, which I can go back to the next slide. If, as you can see, the number of neutrinos affect the density of neutrinos. So if I have some extra whatever behaving like radiation, I would like to be this called this delta n effective. This delta n effective will be related to the boost factor. When I do some, some math, I'm going to find that this is proportional to the lifetime where the, when the decay happened to the mass ratio, because the larger the mass ratio, the more like radiation the dark matter behaves, and to the fraction. This fraction here is the fraction of dark matter particles which are produced this way. I should emphasize, I am not showing here, but not all dark matter particles can be produced this way because of some lima alpha constraints. So I need just one fraction of dark matter being produced this way, which is around 1%. So this F would be like 10 to minus two throughout this talk, okay? But I'm just including there because I'm gonna consider it to be a free parameter because I can change what tune what this F could be and then also tune the mass ratio. But if you have any questions, you can ask me later. Anyways, so if you can see in this plot, what I have here is on the y-axis, I have these F, the fraction of dark matter particles produced through this mechanism, which behaves like, which will behave like radiation. On the x-axis, what I have is the Hubble constant. As you can see, these blobs here are simply saying what kind of Hubble constant I can have depending on the mass ratio of the dark matter particles and the mother particle for different lifetimes. Where did I get these blobs from? I got them from this relation for delta N effective. As delta N effective, as I showed in a previous slide, is related to H naught, I can now translate that delta N effective relation to these parameters. So F, tau, and the mass ratio. I just changed what the parameters I'm showing the plot, basically. And as you can see, for instance, I can have much larger H naught values depending on the masses of the mother and, and the dark matter particle or at least something that behaves like dark matter has 1% of the density of the dark matter, depending on the lifetime I have. So in this way, I can increase H naught and sort of reconcile the tension between the CMB measurements and the local measurements. So that's the problem number three. So <clears throat> the lithium problem, if you ask me how we're gonna solve it, is quite tricky to solve the lithium problem because there's a chain of, chain of reactions which are involved in BBN and it was realized by Pasquale in three years back that <clears throat> one way how to destroy lithium without spoiling the BBN success is by destroying beryllium. As you can see here 
on the the number 12 and the number seven on this reaction chain are the mechanism where lithium seven is produced. So lithium seven comes from either from the fusion of helium four and helium and, and tritium or from the decay or from the friction of beryllium. So you either one or the other, but I need to destroy lithium because as we know, the observations and the BBN predictions differ by a factor of four. So I need to destroy lithium without spoiling the abundance of the other elements we know. So that's quite tricky. So the way it was noticed that we could destroy beryllium in this way, we could also be automatically destroying lithium because most of the abundance from lithium seven comes from beryllium. So that's what we do. So we declare war on beryllium. And the point is that the, the <coughs> The binding energy of beryllium is around 2 MeV. So if, we, if it's 2 MeV, given the process, we already know what kind of dark matter mass this mother particle should have, as the mother particle is much larger, it's much heavier than the dark matter particle, which is chi. Therefore, the mother particle should have a mass around 4 MeV because the mass, the energy that each one of these guys carries around half, right? as long as this guy is much heavier than everything else. So war is declared on beryllium. The lithium problem is important to set the mother particle mass. Notice that the dark matter particle mass is not determined yet. It's still free parameter. The mass ratio is free, but the mother particle mass is set to be 4 MeV because you want to solve the lithium problem, okay? So that's what it's saying here. The mother particle should have a mass of about 4 MeV. So now combining the two things together. So what I do is, again, I have the mass ratio of the particle, mother particle and the chi particle. And here is the lifetime where the decay happened. And these red band here are the values that H0 could have depending on these parameters I choose. And this green band here is the region at which the lithium problem is partly solved, not fully solved but it's, you can reduce by 80% the lithium abundance. So you sort of, you are like close to a two sigma from, from fully solving the lithium problem. And so the region where there is an overlap between the red region and the green region is the region where both problems are solved. This bounds here, CMB and Pixie. Pixie is just an idealized CMB experiment, but the CMB is taking into account. This one is quite, it's not that new. It's not from Planck, but it's from WMAP uh, 9. This is the bounds. This bounds come, comes from the fact that the, <clears throat> when you have dark matter being produced for that way, that gamma particle that's produced, it might give rise to Compton scattering and that might distort the CMB spectrum from a black body one. And that yields a <clears throat> chemical potential, which is different from zero, and then you can constrain that. So just to explain this slide that these regions here for H0 are simply a result of the previous plot I showed where you have these possible values for H0. And so having in mind the CMB bounds is around constraining the chemical potential to be smaller than about 10 to minus four, then you should have a lifetime and this mass ratio between, for instance, lifetime should be smaller than 10 to six seconds and the mass ratio can be basically anything you want. However, since you want to solve the lithium problem and the H0 problems at the same time with the same mechanism, then you're restricted to live in this area over here, which is constrained by this box. So, uh, excuse yes? me, you have two minutes. Okay, fine. So, so you should have a lifetime around 10 to four seconds to 10 to five seconds and a mass ratio between 10, around, let's say 10 to three. Remember this, actually this mass ratio should be around 10 to five because F is the fraction of dark matter, of the density of the dark matter. So the dark matter particle, chi, so chi is not the dark matter of our universe, it's like a fraction of it, 
which is around 1%. So if it is around 10 to minus 2, the mass ratio should be around 10 to 5. So the dark matter is, is indeed relativistic when it's produced. So the conclusion, I, I reached my conclusion is that, so this mechanism is able to solve the H0 problem, the lithium problem at the same time. And you would say this, this for instance, if Fritz were alive, he would say they are not spherical, they are spherical not important compared to dark matter. But once you tie chi to the dark matter density, then you might say they are spherically important. But I should emphasize that we have not solved the dark matter particle, the dark matter problem, because chi is just a fraction of it. That's what I had to say. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Farinaudo. So I have received uh, a message from Fabio. So Fabio, we have uh, one minute or one minute and a half. I'll be quick. It's more like a few comments rather than a question. So the first one, I'm extremely happy to hear that your daughter is doing well. I guess every problem gets amplified in these times. I'm really, really glad to hear that. Uh, the other comment is, thank you for thanking us. I think Manuela's name should definitely be on the list because Manuela has also been extremely engaged over the first years of this workshop. Uh, but to science, uh, I'll be critical and apologize about it, but I've been doing this for a while. So the lithium problem has not been around for a decade. The lithium problem has been around for almost four decades since 1982, which incidentally is the year my brother was born. So bad things all happen in the same year, 2020. But the thing is that problem, you don't need to worry. That doesn't need to be solved. So the problem is that for the last 20 years, the, the lithium problem should have simply not been around. Whatever people take as an observation that you call an observation has nothing, 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 nothing to do with the primordial lithium, okay? Nothing. I can go on for hours and explain you why. The fact that some part of the community still use it is something that I hope the students are understanding that has nothing to do with that. And I can give you endless seminars on it. The good news is, First of all, you don't need to solve that problem in a primordial environment because it's, it's, not a, it's not a cosmological problem. The second new good news is even if your H0 solution spoils the lithium a little bit, like this doesn't, it, it reduces the lithium by the strand beryllium, that's still not important because in any case, we're never observing primordial lithium-7. So we're not absor observing anywhere in the universe any lithium-7 that belongs to the primordial parts of the universe. So even if you destroy it a little bit, you're, it's not like deuterium that you, you have a problem. So the take-home message is, please, let's talk about the lithium-7 problem because it's something that belongs more to a psychiatric world than cosmology, okay? So, so you're saying it has to do with how we measure the lithium? No, I'm just saying that the single value that was pinpointed, it's in the atmospheres of halo stars. It was a single value in 82. And it has nothing to do with primordial. It was forced to believe that it was primordial. And at the moment, it's not even a single value. It is a huge dispersion as, as per the observations of the last 10 years. Um, we can talk more about that. Guys, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I have to unfortunately stop sorry. this very interesting conversation. So maybe we can uh, pick it up again uh, afterwards. Farinado, thanks a lot for the talk. I think uh, we can move on. So our next speaker is going to be Andre. Okay, I see. I, I can't hear yes. you. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're going to have 20 minutes. I'm going to give you a warning after 10. Okay, thanks, Craig. Um, so I, I'm very pleased to be here with all of you, uh, even though virtually. And uh, thanks a lot to the organizers for making all of this happen. So today I'd like to talk about the project we did recently with uh, Krzysztof Jodwowski, who presented a poster about it yesterday as well. And it's about the connection between self-interacting dark matter and the H0 tension. And in particular, I want to share an idea of how to revive an old method of dark matter production that can uh, be helpful in model building with addressing one or two of those problems. All right, so my outline, I will start with a short motivation, then talk about the idea, which is uh, the self-interacting dark matter from late decays. And then I'll talk about the example model and uh, show some results for it. Um, so the motivation, Lambda CDM, as we all know, is a fantastic theory, but it does have some few quibbles. And on a small scale, as we discussed in this workshop, there are problems like diversity, too big to fail, core versus cup, or missing satellites problems. 
which uh, can be can be kind of addressed by dark matter self interactions. While on the uh, larger scales, we have uh, the tensions between the determinations of uh, lambda CDN parameters from early universe and from later measurements, most notably the Hubble tension, which as Fernando mentioned, and uh, with some small other, other tensions as well present in data. So uh, typically cosmologists would consider those to be really cosmological problems and would not consider dark matter to be a, a promising solution, but let us here ask the question, what is the role for dark matter? in uh, both of them. Uh, so it is well known <clears throat> that the, for the small scale problems, if one goes beyond the collision as cold dark matter paradigm, uh, example by having one component or including self interactions, one can address some of the cosmological problems. And so there's a quite ri rich literature on this. And here just me mentioned that uh, it, it looks like the most promising solution is if dark matter is left tracking for exchange of a light mediator. And, and, that, and then many of those problems can be more or less addressed. While for the early versus late problems, um, let us point out that in lambda CDM, the dark matter component is extremely simple. Maybe even one would say too simplistic. It's non-interacting, cold, and it has constant equation of state throughout the whole evolution. However, it was pointed out some time ago that uh, at late times, if a fraction of energy is transferred to radiation, example for decay or annihilation, and what Finaldo is also discussing just, just a moment ago, then this can significantly affect the evolution and therefore perhaps elevate the Hubble tension as well. So the question is, can we address both uh, type of problems at the same time with dark matter only? Uh, before we can address this, uh, there are some issues one has to take into account and have in mind. One is that if, uh, if you have a dark matter model with self-interaction from light mediator, those models are typically quite constrained, especially if you insist on thermal production. So here there's an example of a, of a model for a light mediator uh, one, one fermion interacting with sunlight mediator and on this plot you can see the blue band gives you the elastic scattering cross-section of the correct order while all the other colors are limits and as you can see uh, in this case everything is excluded either via C and D or indirect detection and this is of course only one simple model and this constraints can be evaded in several ways uh, but it's important to note that uh, many of those constraints are quite severe in general models as well. And one has to be careful with building models of this type. And this is because the light mediator, if it's coupled to standard model, because it's light, it affects uh, a lot of uh, observations like CMB, indoor detection, and also colliders. Uh, and the second issue I want to mention is that if one wants to solve the Hubble tension through such a transition, uh, this, uh, this has to happen very late, at least from a particle physics point of view. And if, it, if this transition goes through annihilation, then enormous rates are needed. Uh, but uh, you can see here there are, there are examples of models that, that do the job pretty well. Uh, while if it goes through a decay, then there are uh, two points. One is that the rate of the change of the equation of state is not ideal for the fit. Actually, something like annihilation would be preferred. And secondly, what uh, I want to focus on is that uh, one needs to ensure that only a small fraction of dark matter decayed. Uh, so it's either have an extremely long lifetime or there you have a multi-component dark matter. And on this plot, you can see, for instance, in this uh, recent analysis uh, by Haridasu and Vio, uh, that uh, the fraction of dark matter which decayed is uh, of the order of like 8%, the best fit here. Um, okay, so what is what is our idea? So uh, let's uh, be still in a, in a framework of dark matter self tracking through light mediator. So dark matter k and the mediator A. And, but in order to avoid limits from C and B and indirect detection, I will insist that the mediator is stable. So stable light mediator is typically a big problem because it overcloses the universe if it's present in the plasma. 
uh, it's uh, it's light, it's uh, very well, very strongly populated, and uh, it's stable, it doesn't decay. So what we'll do here is that we'll assume that it was actually never in equilibrium. So we'll think of a production mechanism like freezing, or uh, in our case, like super wind. So both freezing and super wind productions uh, give viable, though maybe not that unexpected mechanism for also self-interacting dark matter production. But the super wind has an intriguing feature, which <coughs> which made us interested in this in this idea. So the super wind dark matter production is something that uh, Farinado mention mentioned as well, is that if you have some wind-like state which decays to dark matter, so it first undergoes freeze out, it's coupled to the standard model uh, as a normal wind-like uh, particle, but it decays, it decays to dark states. And uh, then the final dark matter can be very decoupled from the standard model, for instance, like gravitino. And, but what is interesting in our case is that if the chi is assumed to be self-interacting, then unavoidably, you have not only leading order decays, but also decays at the next to leading order, which directly produce the mediator, either through free body processes or from one loop processes. And this, uh, this of course, are suppressed, but they're only suppressed by uh, powers of a coupling constant G, which doesn't have to be small. And, for, and in fact, in many cases, when the self-interaction has to be large, this coupling is uh, or a weak scale or, or maybe even stronger. So therefore, parametrically, the branching ratio of S decaying to states containing the light mediator uh, can easily be of order one to 10%. Which means that if the mass splitting between the S connector state and the two M chi is small, then what happens there is that S decays mostly to matter, which is chi, and with a small fraction to radiation. So we get property needed to modify the expansion rate in a, in a way we want, in a completely automatic way. So this is a curious observation and how can we address it in a, in a kind of more complete model? So as an example, let's take a Higgs portal, a very weak Higgs portal in which the standard model is connected to dark sector only via some connector S, which uh, we'll assume has a wind-like symmetry Z2. That is however broken explicitly or spontaneously at some very high scale uh, with breaking parameter parameterized by epsilon, which we assume to be a very small parameter. Andre, sorry to interrupt. Just to let you know that you are 10 minutes from the end. Okay, okay thanks. Yeah. Uh, so in, in such a model, the relevant interaction terms in Lagrangian are given us here. So in the blue, you have the term that gives you the interaction of S with the Higgs. This is uh, one that gives you standard freeze out of S. And uh, then you have the decay processes because uh, related to the breaking of Z2. So SK decay to chi chi bar uh, with a very long lifetime. And it also could decay to HH uh, if possible or to other standard model states. But we'll assume that uh, since there is additional coupling present there, we'll assume that this is subdominant. And then finally, we have an interaction within the dark sector, which we'll assume to be a U1 interaction with a massive uh, gauge boson A. And uh, this, cup, this is uh, given by the coupling G, which is not tied in this case to dark matter production. So therefore it can be, can be large and in fact can be varied independently. Okay, so in this type of situation, this type of model, you have four distinct regimes depending on how uh, long uh, how, how long is the lifetime of S. So in this plot, you see uh, this three, four different regimes. If S decays quickly, uh, it's in gray regime zero, which, which makes the uh, dark sector thermalized with the standard model sector and you are left up with a usual thermal self-interacting model, which is not our interest here. Then if uh, lifetime is a bit longer, then you have a usual super wind production. Uh, and this is a viable situation when you have only uh, self-inactive dark matter, but not addressing Hubble tension. 
Then if the lifetime is even longer at the cosmological scales, uh, you, have, uh, you can address perhaps both. And then if it's even longer, then you end up with two component dark matter. One is because not of S is able to decay till today. We have both S and chi present and uh, some part of it is called CDM like the S and some is self-interacting like the chi part. So in general, this uh, the other angle looking on this model is that uh, uh, it can be viewed as, a, viewed as an extension of a usual Higgs portal dark matter to weaker couplings. All right, so let me now go to, for, to the results. And so first the regime A, uh, when we address only the self-interaction part. Uh, so here you have two plots which show the same, but for different value of the coupling G. And these are on the plane of the dark matter mass versus the light mediator mass. And the colorful band here shows the um, the preferred region for the elastic scattering cross section to solve the small scale problems. And you can see that, especially if you take into account that you can vary the coupling gene, you can go be interpolate between these two plots, that there's a quite uh, wide parameter space uh, available for such a model, uh, given correct self interactions. And what is important to stress is that. Once again, that here the mediator is stable and it doesn't uh, violate any, any limits. So you have a perfectly, uh, about slightly more complicated than usual, but perfectly good uh, self-interacting dark matter model. Now, if uh, we want, if we go to the next regime when the lifetime is longer and we want to address the Hubble tension, let's first talk slightly about the Hubble tension um, in the decaying dark matter models. So. It has been noted that uh, in many papers that decaying dark matter with uh, just two parameters, uh, giving the lifetime essentially and how much of the energy is transferred to radiation can improve the fit to the Hubble parameter uh, over the cold dark matter uh, model. And there were many papers about this and uh, with a slight diff different analysis, but also with different variations of these models of this type of decays, which, uh, which is quite, uh, consequential. Uh, so uh, it's hard to summarize this in one sentence, but maybe just let me say that the consensus seems to look like that uh, it's hard to completely solve the Hubble tension with such an approach, but it can help to elevate it somehow, somewhat. Okay, but the, since our model is slightly different than the one studied, we performed our own fit uh, for to the cosmological parameters using all this data. And uh, having two priors, the long lifetime in red and the blue lifetime, in, uh, short lifetime in blue. And then in these two fits, we found uh, two preferred uh, regimes. In the short lifetime, the preferred regime would be with lifetime of four mega years and the fraction of dark matter being strongly constrained of the decaying part to be below roughly 1%. And in the long time, lifetime, uh, we get the uh, uh, lifetime of order five giga years, and then the degradation, the fraction going to the degradation is allowed as, as big as 10%. And when you look on the, how much actually the Hubble parameter changes, you can see the change is statistically significant, but not very large and still there's far away to go to um, log to the local measurement. And uh, therefore the, uh, in our particular realization of the model, it's rather mild improvement over lambda CDM, uh, but this type of model can play a part in the full solution. So for instance, if there is indeed some systematics or some cosmological uh, modification of lambda CDM, this can be part of the solution. But still, st statistically, this model is preferred over lambda CDM. Uh, just, uh, and and uh, with this one can do, uh, one can show what is, what is the best fit in the uh, parameter uh, space of this model. So again, we have mass of the chi versus the mass of the mediator. But here we show only the points which uh, satisfy the, which are, okay, actually, which are very narrow around one centimeter squared of a gram. And uh, th that are, they are preferred from this mosque problems point of view. And then you can see that the best fit region to cosmological data uh, spans many orders of magnitude in terms of mediator mass, which is quite natural. Because at, at some point, the, the light of the mediator doesn't, behaves like masses in some sense, but it's quite specific for the dark matter mass. And, and then also uh, let me point out that this, there are 
some points are overshadowed by some gray regions, and this is because uh, those points uh, would have uh, would be intentional structure formation because then the dark matter if decays happen length, so if the dark matter gets too much kinetic energy due to the decay, it uh, it can spoil the structure formation. But uh, most of the parameter space is is perfectly fine. Uh, okay, uh, so so this is in the regime B when we want to address both and uh, clearly there is a parameter region which uh, uh, helps double Hubble tension, maybe not solve it completely, but helps and uh, provides the small scale problem solutions, at least have a potential to do so. All right, and uh, in regime C, it's a regime in which uh, the lifetime is even longer, so not uh, all S will decay. And some, some, of, some of this S will stay stick around and will have to component dark matter, as I mentioned. And what is interesting that is in such a situation, the self-interacting component, which is a subdominant, can be actually much, have much larger scattering cross-section. It was even argued that if there is no more than roughly 10% of the self-interacting component, there is no upper limit from the cross on the cross-section because even if it was completely stripped away, then still this would not be within the limits of measurement. Andrei, sorry, just two minutes left. Two minutes left, yeah, I'm, I'm quite, quite close to, to the end. Um, okay, so uh, in, in this case, we, there was a proposal that such a ultra self-interacting dark matter component can, pro can be quite useful to provide a candidate mechanism for seeding the formation of supermassive black holes. And we know that standard forma formation theory is challenged by observations of a very old uh, redshift over the seven supermassive black holes. And on this plot, we show how this uh, cross, so above the red line, we see that the cross section, if the dark matter has such a large cross section at a given uh, F prime being the fraction of the ultra self interacting dark matter, this uh, region above can, can help to uh, speed up this, this SMBH formation. And then if you want to connect to the Hubble tension, then uh, one is actually in a, one needs to be in this uh, blue region here. And there's a one problem that it's quite hard to have uh, both at the same time for the reason that between redshift seven and- I have to finish. Seconds. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, it's kind of hard to have both. You can have I one or the other. All right, and just to mention the final bonus, uh, we just assume that the discussion is stable. It doesn't have to be. In fact, if it's not stable, you can, and it has a kinetic mixing of this order, it can perfectly well fit the xm one ton excess, which was kind of a, something we observed uh, just at the very end when it arrived. Okay, so these are my conclusions. I'll just leave it. Okay, thank you very much. And sorry. Thank you very much. So, sorry to, to, to catch no, you. No, no, thanks. <laughs> okay, so since we are, uh, we are a bit, uh, uh, we are running out of time. So I will, um, um, I encourage uh, all, everybody that have some question just to send uh, in the chat to Andre. So Andre, thank you very much again yeah, for the nice so talk. Much. And we move on to our next speaker, Nicolas. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me guys? Yes. Yes. Good. So let me share the screen. Okay. You're gonna have 20 minutes. I'm gonna give you a warning after time. Thanks. Perfect. Uh, are you seeing my screen? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Enrico. And well, thanks a lot uh, to you, to uh, well, to all of you guys for, for this super nice workshop and for giving me the opportunity of presenting my work here. So we'll talk about um, basic gravitational dark matter produced by primordial black holes and, and gravitational UV freezing. This is based in these works, in particular with this one, uh, made in collaboration with Oscar Zapata from Universidad um, de Antioquia in Medellin, Colombia. So I say I'm Nicolas Bernal from Universidad Antonio de Nariño in Bogota, Colombia. Okay, so I think at this point I don't have to convince about the evidence of, of the existence of, the of dark matter. However, I just want to, to emphasize that all the indication of this uh, missing uh, gravitational force are really gravitational, right? So, so far, we only have this kind of, of, of proof. So we all like, uh, when talking about the production of dark matter, uh, we love the wind mechanism because it can be tested in different ways. However, as you know, there's a kind of uh, growing tension because there's no 
compelling evidence of this uh, production mechanism, right, of wind, dark matter being wind. We have seen other possibilities, for instance, fins uh, or or seams, as we especially have seen dark matter, also uh, co-seams uh, yesterday by Yuri. Um, so we don't know how dark matter is produced, but spec is produced via some particle physics portal. However, the question remains, what if dark matter only couples to the standard model via gravitational interaction? So this seems like a nightmare for us. However, it can be produced. We know how it can be produced via gravitational interactions. And one possibility is via uh, the, the evaporation, the Hawking evaporation of primordial black holes because dark matter will be unavoidably produced via this kind of, of, of scenario. So in particular, via the evaporation of primordial black holes. Um, okay, so we'll have, uh, after my talk, a couple of talks dedicated to this uh, 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 possibility, by in particular by Kanner and Bradley. So a couple of words about CBA. So one possibility is that density, the big density fluctuations can collapse into primordial black holes in the very early universe, just after uh, reheating. So once produced, uh, these black holes will emit all dark matter, all, sorry, all particles, so standard models and beyond standard model particles via Hawking operation. So the idea is the black hole will have basically uh, a black body spectrum, of course, up to these great factors. And they have a temperature, black hole will have a temperature which is basically uh, given by the inverse of, of this matter. So, as dark matter, uh, uh, sorry, as black holes evolve, they start uh, um, evaporating, its mass will, will, will decrease, and then its temperature will start uh, going up. So, at some point, as I uh, tell you, uh, they, they will start radiating all, all particles, but in particular, dark matter. So, dark matter will be produced via the evaporation of the primordial black holes. Another point is that if these black holes are kind of light, so lighter than 10 to 9 grams or so, so 100 tons, something like this, they will completely evaporate before the onset of the DM. And therefore, they, will be, they, they, they are very poorly constrained. Okay? So, of course, if you want to have like a full description of the, of, of the formation of TBA, you have to, I mean, kind of, for the complicated process, you have to take into account how, how the, what's the reheating dynamic. So, but however, we have to take like an effective approach where uh, given by basically two free parameters where the first parameter is the initial mass, what they call M initial, the initial mass of, of, of the black hole for its mass at formation. But if you want, it can be traced by the other parameter T initial, which is the, the standard mode temperature at formation. So with this parameter, either the, the initial mass of the black hole or the initial standard mode temperature formation, all like the characteristics of the black hole are completely uh, separate. Because so then you know what the evaporation rate, what the temperature of, of the cooperation, its temperature, etc. So a single black hole is characterized by this parameter, of course, assuming that they have uh, no charge and, and, and no spin. However, we don't want to deal with a single black hole, but we want an initial population. And this initial population is parameterized by this, by this quantity beta, which is basically the ratio of energy density stored in black holes with respect to the standard mole energy density. Right? So this beta characterizes the initial TBA energy density. And now, how is uh, dark matter uh, form, uh, how is it produced from black holes? So the idea is very simple. If there is no sizable felt interactions, the dark matter density is basically the product of the primordial black hole density times the number of dark matter particles emitted per black hole. So it's as simple as that, right? And uh, the initial, um, the number of dark matter particles will depend on the, only on the initial TDH mass, right? So it can basically, and it's very simple. If you assume that it's basically a, a, a black body spectrum, so it's super simple to compute how many particles are emitted in the whole uh, history of, 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 of the black hole, right? So there are two expressions, either it's dark matter is kind of light with respect to the initial black body temperature, Sorry, uh, yeah, black hole tempers or, or if it's um, heavier. Another point is that as TDA scale like normal matter, 
Um, so like uh, like dust. So its energy density will stay like a to the minus three, where a is just the same factor. They eventually, well, they can dominate the total energy density of the universe, right? So because they they scale like matter, with the radiate and radiation scale like radiation, so like a to the minus four. Nicolas. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. So I wanted to let you know that we are you are eleven minutes away from the end of the time, and we are hearing a background noise. Uh, Yes, okay, the background noise is my selection. No, no, okay, it's coming from you, right? Okay. <laughs> so it's my fault. No, no, that's okay. Okay, yes, thanks, uh, Rico. Um, so I was saying that TBH will naturally lead to a non standard uh, expansion era of the, of the universe. Okay, so now here I told that we have basically two pre parameters beta and the initial temperature. So we don't want, so this uh, what's that like, uh, response to the PMB. So we don't want the initial temperature to be much higher than 10 to the 16 because of the scale of inflation and in contradiction with the Planck measurement. And also I want the PBH to evaporate before BBN. So I want this P the initial temperature to be smaller than higher story that tend to extend or so. That means that the black hole that we are considering will be in the range of say grams, so from 10 to minus one to 10 to the eight or so grams. Okay, also I want to avoid this, this region because in this region which GW corresponds to the, the, the region where the gravitational waves are super dominant and so we can have a back reaction problem, back reaction for it. So I mean where gravitational waves are, are dominating over radiation. And this line corresponds, this dotted line corresponds to the, to the border, the frontier. Below that line, the universe is always dominated by free radiation and PVA. Okay, now these four lines correspond to the parameter region where we can reproduce observed dark matter abundance for four different dark matter masses. The first one corresponds to one and TV, this one to one TV, 10 to the nine, and 10 to the 15. So one important thing to see first is can produce all dark matter masses from one MeV or so to super light to super heavy, basically to the uh, uh, Planck plant scale. Okay, and we're for um, have problem with structure. For many people, if dark matter is lighter than, say, 30 or so GV, we can have problems with the uh, warm dark matter. Bluish band, the constraints of structure formation in the case. So, and here in the, what, green corresponds to the region where we can never produce uh, the, the observed uh, dark matter abundance. You have a, an underabundance. I want to emphasize that basically we can radiate uh, basically all dark matter. Uh, mass. Now here I'm just showing the exactly the same information we in so that so I put the axis and the y axis I have the initial temperature or if you want the initial mass. Right, for scale of inflation, BBN, the dark matter under abundance, and warm dark matter. How to produce dark matter mm, by the, uh, the operation of, of PDA. Uh -huh. hey, and here Nicolas, we want to emphasize that the book, yes? Nicolas, sorry, the, the connection is breaking. Can you switch off oh. the camera? Yes. Sure. How? Uh, I think you need to exit from the from the share screen mode. Okay, I'm not seeing you anymore. Yes. Um. But we can space for okay. These parameters very simply correspond to heavy and very high temperatures, right? 
So the dark matter is produced, okay, the black holes are produced at very high temperatures. And if you think about heavy dark matter produced at very high temperatures, I mean, I can't. Yeah, matter is also uh, viable and very effective in that, and that yeah. for that. that no. uh, example of the general UV. Nicolas, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, we, we can't understand anything, unfortunately. It's, um, yeah, your, uh, your sound is breaking up completely. I don't, I don't know if you can hear me. Hear you without any problem. Hello? Oh, okay, now I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, so let's see if I, I'm telling that this gravitational UV freezing is just an example of the UV freezing, where the mediator now is the normal mass, the standard model. So the dark matter can be produced out of scattering, so two standard model particles produce dark matter particles via the S, can we exchange graviton, right? So this will depend basically on the dark matter mass and its spin, and its resisting temperature. So always everything is settled by by GR. So the only couple coupling is the Planck mass. So everything is completely settled, and the dark dance is basically done given by the dark ratio, reheating temperature of the Planck mass uh, cube, right? And here in this plot, I'm showing the heating temperature needed in order to produce the dark matter mass. Right? Where the dark matter can be produced via this gravitation. But I like here, I, there's no, basically there's no uh, temperature. And again, the same, Nicolas, I think we lost you. Uh, uh, Nicolas, are you there? Oh. We can't hear anything. Yeah, we we can't uh, we can't understand uh, anything, Nicolas. Uh, it's. Uh, it's a, it's a few minutes that we can't understand anything. Okay, I, I think his connection is gone. Okay, so maybe not to lose our momentum, we can... Uh, well, let's... Okay, I Hello? see. Nicolas, uh, are you back online? Nicolas? No, I cannot hear you guys. And uh, we, we, we hear you completely, your, uh, yeah, your sound is completely broken. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, I, I, yeah. yeah I, unfortunately, I think we should move on. Yeah, I think we should maybe move on. Uh, Hello, I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes, now yes. Okay, I have two, one more slide. Okay, okay, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Let's see. Can, can, can you hear my, can you hear my yeah. slides again? Yeah. Okay, so, sorry, so, sorry for this. Is this no, that, that's all right, of course. <laughs> uh, so and now what I'm doing is just putting together these two gravitational dark matter production mechanisms, which correspond to the PVH evaporation and the gravitational UV freezing. So I'm, I'm showing you exactly the same parameter space. So the initial temperature, which can be, uh, um, uh, it is not exactly the reheating temperature, but uh, the, the reheating temperature has to be bigger than C, C initial, right? Because I want the dark matter, the PVH to be produced in a, in, in a, in a radiation dominated era. 
Cochlear fit is a two, uh, the two mechanism, and this plot I'm showing you is key initial as a function of the target matter mass. And here I'm showing you the these uh, gray regions correspond to the parameter space where the dark matter is effect effectively produced by the gravitational UV freezing. So inside this uh, area, you have a dark matter overproduction. So the basic, the, 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 the main point is that gravitational UV freezing strongly constrains super heavy dark matter radiated by PDA, right? Just because uh, we have, we could have a, a dark matter over overabundance, right? So these are for different uh, choices of theory heat. So here corresponds Q heat equal to C initial, or Q heat equal to 10 to the 16. It's like an extreme case, 16 GVs, or a reheating temperature of the order of 10 to the 14 GVs or, or so. So you can see that there's a strong interplay between these two production mechanisms. Um, and that's it. So so even if dark matter is not coupled via the traditional particle physics portal, dark matter can only uh, feature, I mean, it's a possibility that it only feature gravitational interactions. And in that case, TBH will produce the whole observed dark matter abundance. So we have seen how the dark, the PBH can be formed in the early universe. And if they lie in the range of say the grams to hundreds of tons, they will evaporate before BBN. And they can produce dark matter masses in the range of between MEVs or basically the Planck mass. And the, in order to have that, the standard model temperatures at the moment of formation of PDH is in the range of 10 to the 12 GV to 10 to the 16 or so. And the other point is that the gravitational UV freezing is very effective in the very same ballpark, right? And then there's a strong interplay between these two gravitational productions, so PBH evaporation and gravitational UV freezing that sets strong, uh, strong constraints. And just want to emphasize that these gravitational dark matter productions are completely unavoidable because there are no free topping, basically, it's just the, 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 the plant mass. And uh, right, how to set these scenarios? I think uh, uh, we'll see the ways in the next two talks by by Turner and, and, and Bradley. But uh, Malcolm already told us some, some possibilities yesterday. Huh? For instance, looking at these curvature constraints, gravitational waves in particular, number of geometry. And I think that that was basically all they want to tell you guys. So thank you very much. And sorry for this network connection. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Nicolas. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I don't, I don't think we appreciated your talk uh, as you would have deserved. I deserved. Them. I'm really sorry about that. Um, so we don't have, unfortunately, time for questions. So if anybody has questions for Nicolas, I encourage, I strongly encourage them to send them directly in the chat to Nicolas. And uh, thanks again. And we can move on to our next speaker, which is going to be Kanner. And Hello. if I'm not pronouncing it correctly. Hi, I can't, he I can't hear you. You can't hear me? No, no I, can, I can. You can hear me. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can see you. OK. Um, let me share my screen. You see now, okay. So it will be a bit, uh, we call it as a potpourri, but uh, I will be happy to hear the feedback. So I prepared also a little bit handwritten notes. So I will jump from uh, slide to slide, but let's see how okay. it's gonna be. So Let's you're see. gonna have 20 minutes. I'm gonna okay. give you a warning after time. Sounds good. Okay, everybody can see and I'm starting. So, uh, okay, this talk is, uh, like a work we did with Eli and the Subot uh, a few months ago, and we just submitted to the journal. I mean, a few months ago, actually. Um, so the main idea is the following. Um, so we have inflation and we could probe it in the largest scales of the observable universe, like a large scale structure and CMB. The question is, uh, if these guys are probing, let's say this uh, 10 folds of this 50, 60 fold of inflation, how could we probe the smaller scales of inflation? And then can we say anything conclusively about this primordial black holes? Because there are so many talks and so many attention and they are mostly model dependent and the statistics dependent of the primordial fluctuations. 
The question is, can we be able to say at least the ones larger than the solar mass or fraction of a solar mass conclusively, just from the global cosmological signal? So that's the whole uh, uh, picture. So this is the standard inflationary scenario. This is for scalar perturbations. This is for tensor or gravitational wave perturbations. Uh, these are our two point functions power spectrum as standard people know. And CMB looks at the largest scales of our universe, uh, these two guys basically. And then if you have a model in, in this region, then you're happy that, but uh, like you are satisfying the contours that Planck give you, but there are probably thousands of models there. But then the question is the following. So inflation is roughly to solve some problems like uh, that we know requires 50, 60 e folds of inflation. CMB plus large scale structure gives you about, um, I don't know, maybe seven, eight e folds. And we measure this part very precisely, right? So there is no question about that. And it corresponds about, yeah, seven, 10 e folds. But what about the rest? This is the question uh, I would like to try to attack. With mu and y distortions, we are gonna probe a bit uh, in this way, like maybe 10 more e folds. But then we show that with the inflation, uh, gravitational waves, the new upcoming uh, interferometers uh, and pulsar timing areas, you could be able to probe these guys, these uh, much smaller scales of inflation very precisely. Um, so let me uh, jump to the, uh, some handwritten notes for you guys, telling the whole heart of the story. Um, okay, so I just, discuss this. Um, um, so this is the whole actual inflationary uh, uh, plateau, okay? We have in K, which is the co-moving wave numbers in megaparsec inverse from 10 to the minus four to 10 to the almost 20, okay? But uh, we have only uh, probing here. So the question is, can we probe this rest 50 e-folds or 45 e-folds? And related with the primordial black holes, can we say anything independent from the astrophysics, which is a huge issue because you don't know too much the accretion and merger factors and the statistics of the primordial fluctuations and some clustering effects. So that we could really just probe cosmological global signals to say a few words about primordial black holes and the real inflation. So there are two such uh, signals we could attack and we could try to concentrate on. One is this uh, famous CMB distortions. What are they? Uh, they are just deviations from the black body uh, shape or spectrum of the CMB photons. How you can do it? When you reach uh, some redshifts, less than a, about a million, right? Like here, um, you still bump energy to the photon and the baryon plasma. However, um, this energy should be turned into some photons as well so that you could keep your uh, black body, right? Because when you have number density, it goes with by the just dimension analysis, T cubed times some order one factor. But you cannot produce uh, photons after uh, like redshift million because these processes are not efficient. Like uh, uh, then what you do, you, you, you reshuffle your uh, uh, spectrum and produce some chemical potential. So actually what CME distortions means is exactly that. So there are different uh, types of distortions, but these mu distortions are nothing but some chemical potential that your um, uh, abundance of your photons reshuffle themselves. Uh, if you give them some energy by these uh, density perturbations from the inflationary scale. So the formula, the, the, the naive physics is just uh, some log logarithmic integral dk over k over some power spectrum for a given uh, window function. This window function is um, just to indicate, set the stage for the relevant range of the uh, uh, redshifts or uh, wave numbers. So for, as you see here, from the megaparsec inverse scale to the 10 to the five megaparsec inverse scale, these mu distortions could be uh, a good probe of your uh, physics actually. Both detection and the uh, null result means you, you don't detect anything. Um, this is global signal. There is no discussion about accretion. There's no discussion about astrophysics. These guys are there or not, then it imply another thing. So another signal, um, could be interesting is this is electromagnetic signal. So what about the gravitational waves? Because you see, uh, when I just show this figure up here, 
Um, some of these scales are corresponding to really tiny scales, and these are completely nonlinear now, right? If you cannot go really far back, you cannot probe these guys because these are all subgalactic, so super nonlinear scales. But maybe gravity waves, which are propagating freely, could tell you a few words. What is this? So gravitational waves decouple from the density perturbations, scalar perturbations at the linear level in homogeneous and the isotropic backgrounds. We know it, right? Scalar vector tensor perturbations decouple. But in the quadratic order, these guys talk to each other. Like uh, you can probe some gravitational waves by some density perturbations. As you see, we have the standard box operator just propagating gravitational waves, H term, which is transverse traceless, is sourced by some uh, transverse traces ij part, and which is proportional to some uh, delta i zeta, delta j zeta. You can read this as roughly just the gravitational potential, okay? That's the perturbation, gravitational potential there, uh, connected up to an, uh, some factors, depending on the equation of state. Cool, but you know how to solve this equation, right? It's just some second order differential equation. As long as you find the screen function, you just do the standard convolution integral. You integrate over time, you have some green function and you have a source which is quadratic because at linear order they decouple, I just discussed. Then uh, the details are in the paper, uh, but I just want to give the physics and heart of this uh, insight. Then you can immediately see when you compute two point function of this guy, right, h, h, and you correlate them, which will tell you later on the power spectrum and the omega gravitational waves should be proportional to square of the p zeta, right? Because this source is quadratic. Then you can immediately realize that pH has to be proportional to p zeta, some order one corrections coming from the green function and other stuff. And then this order one factor could be dependent, dependent on the uh, statistical properties of the zeta what is the width of the signal? Like uh, if there's a bump or if there are other statistics, you, uh, other properties, you could also probe them. Then there's this order one factor, which depends on a couple other uh, um, um, physical quantities. So let me just summarize what I discussed now. So you could uh, probe P zeta two ways. One is this electromagnetically, which is just distortions. Uh, if you have an experiment, let's say, which could probe this mu guy, order of 10 to the minus eight, like a pixie, then immediately this integral, assuming this uh, factor is order one, uh, you can probe your p zeta about 10 to the minus eight level. And then um, for the scales from one to 10 to, the, 10 to the five, you have a really good precision because remember p zeta at CMB scales is 10 to the minus nine. So we expect the situation could be a little worse for the gravity waves, but let's see, let's do the calculation. So pH goes with the p zeta square times some order one factor, which I will show in a second in the paper. Uh, but uh, just from this heuristic derivation, assuming these modes are in the radiation dominated era because they're so small scales, they re-enter the horizon um, uh, in the radiation dominated era, you have these gravitational waves that scale as a, a radiation, right? Which we have now 10 to the minus four for photons. So it should be same for the gravitons as well. Then you have your power spectrum, that's it, which is P zeta square probe. So you just invert this <laughs> simple, uh, uh, analytic relation and you find that p zeta could be probed up to level of this relation, just some 10 to the two coming from inverse of this times um, omega gravitational waves in the square root. So the interesting thing is at different scales uh, uh, um, uh, of inflationary stage, we will have interferometers. Let me just go up here. So- um, Sorry yeah. to interrupt, just to let you know that uh, you still have 10 minutes until the end of your total time. Perfect, perfect. So you see here, Y and mu distortions, we will have a we'll probe here with gravity waves from pulsar timing arrays. Here, Lisa will be uh, uh, probing. This part is probed by the LIGO, Einstein telescope in future and the cycle. Very nice. So you see, we are probing large parts of the inflation just purely from gravity waves, very nice. Then what you do is you plug it here, this omega gravity waves, the sensitivity of your detector, right? Cool, and then for LIGO, this is uh, about 10 to the minus 10 now. And for LISA, it will be 10 to the minus 14. And for PTASK, it will be 10 to the minus 15. And then you will probe your P zeta from 10 to the minus three to 10 to the minus six. Cool. Now I'm gonna discuss very briefly PBH formation, the statistics and uh, how well we could probe primordial black holes. But let me tell you now before uh, passing there, the main conclusions. So this is, uh, these guys are uh, giving uh, these two guys are giving the most sensitive probes for the inflationary perturbations from 
one megaparsec inverse to 10 to the seven megaparsec inverse, which is corresponding to 16 e folds. So our CMB large scale structure uh, uh, probe could be improved, like seven e folds, could be 16 more e folds. Plus, I'll show in a second that any, any primordial black hole mechanism formed by some uh, uh, inflationary stage larger than a solar mass will be detected or ruled out conclusively with these two probes. Anything like a one, two, 10, 100, 10 to the four, 10 to the five, whatever solar masses. And the final thing we find is there is this um, interesting uh, coincidence. People were finding some uh, billion solar mass, uh, supermassive black holes at redshifts, let's say six or seven. And uh, this was a bit curious case because some people start thinking that could they be coming from primordial black holes or whatever. So this, these probes, we will, I will show in a second that will also conclusively um, set the uh, uh, conclusion that if primordial black holes has, are the seeds of the supermassive black holes or not. So independent from any astrophysics, we will probe the inflation 16 more defaults and maybe more. And then we could say conclusive things about the primordial black holes. Cool. And the last stage of my talk is here. I will talk a bit from my paper with uh, Eli and the spot. So now a little bit chat about the supermass uh, primordial black holes. Um, so the previous talk was really informative. So I'm gonna keep it short just to focus on the main points. So typically primordial black holes are formed non-linearly. They are not like astrophysical black holes. So you have some primordial fluctuations or some ways to enhance the density perturbations. They collapse and form in a Hubble time very quickly, these uh, black holes. That's why uh, the wave number or inflationary uh, scale is directly related with the mass of the primordial black holes with some, of course, up to order one uncertainty. It's determined by the simulations. And of course, these primordial black holes could accrete by some factor and also they could merge. And how do you form primordial black holes? You have some density excess, right? Which is larger than some critical threshold, which is typically, as you see here, 0.4 or 5, which is too large with respect to CMB fluctuations, but that's how you form them. And then you have this PDF, right? Probability distribution function, whose area under it is just one because you integrate over all the possibilities, but you form prime order black holes only ones who are larger than the density contrast, larger than some critical density contrast. Cool. And this beta value is uh, much smaller than one typically. So you produce tiny fraction of the horizons as prime order black holes in radiation dominated area. And then since they are non-relativistic, they grow with the scale factor with respect to the radiation. So then in the maybe equality, radiation matter equality, you can have order one uh, dark PBH uh, uh, energy density, cool. But this value, as you see, is directly related to uh, probability distribution function. So it's very important what type of fluctuations you have. Are they Gaussian, are they chi-square or are they highly Gaussian, Gaussian cube or not? Cool. So I just draw something, uh, maybe you could like uh, some funny uh, picture here. Uh, so the story is the following. Assume it's some scale, co-moving scale K, you have uh, a probability distribution, which is um, zeta K, okay, this guy. And then uh, the PDF of this guy is about, uh, at the scale is some, let's say, look at the black one, just some Gaussian. And then you produce black holes only in this region, right? These are larger than the uh, critical. So this is Gaussian distribution, but what if you your, secure your um, uh, distribution? Instead of this guy, assume you have this uh, red one, which is a chi-square, right? Two Gaussian, Gaussian multiply square. So you see for this guy, you have more area under chi-square. And if you even more distort your distribution, you could have even uh, more primordial black holes, which when you have even the same amplitude of P zeta. What I'm saying is that with non-Gaussianity or skewness of the uh, perturbations, you could produce primordial black holes much efficiently. You don't need to go too high uh, P zeta values. So here again, this area is tiny, typically 10 to the minus, less than 10 to the minus eight, but in time in um, uh, radiation dominated era, you grow this much because your primordial black holes are non-relativistic and you're in radiation dominated era. And then this factor could be pretty high. Cool. Then, uh, we understood that the type of fluctuations are important, even though they are Gaussian in the CMB scales, they could be highly non-Gaussian at smaller scales by particle production or some other properties. And then let's come to the final point, how much we could constrain or uh, rule out these guys. I hope I have a couple more minutes, right? Just, I want to discuss these figures now. 
Yeah, yeah, you do. You, you have five or more minutes. Perfect. Great. Thank you. So the story is the following. So this guy is what we have. This is the primordial quantum fluctuations from inflation. Good. And uh, I'm, I just mentioned that from one megaparsec inverse, to approximately 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 4 uh, megaparsec inverse, you probe them with some mu distortion. This shape coming from the window function, because at these scales, the window function has less value, so you need higher values of the p zeta. So this whole red guy uh, uh, region will be probed. And this part, these constraints are coming from the gravitational waves, our completing multi-messenger guy. So these are coming from the next generation pulsar timing array experiment. These are, um, it's called square kilometer array, and it will be much more sensitive than the current ones. So you can realize that the probe will be just this green area. And these red, green, and blue points correspond to what type of uh, statistics are your fluctuations obeying? Because depending on your statistics, you can also produce different uh, amount of gravitational waves. Maybe you remember that I just mentioned this order one factor in the derivation is just there, here. So for Gaussian, chi-square and Gaussian cube guys, high and Gaussian guys, you have slightly different uh, amplitude. But as you see here, this is your primordial black hole mass, seed mass, which is uh, we took from 10 to the minus two to 10 to the three. And as you see, uh, and here is when you include the accretion and merger rates, some rough values. So as you see, even if uh, omega PBH today is 10 to the minus 10, which is very tiny amount, in order to produce that, you have some Gaussian fluctuations, which are indicated by these dashed lines in red. For the chi square guys, you need this black guy, black dashed line. Uh, and these are these two different lines correspond to different accretion and merger rates. And for Gaussian cube, you have this. So when you have these guys, depending on your accretion rate, there is some uncertainty. You produce this much of uh, omega PPH. And as you see, in every cases, when your primordial black holes have a mass, larger than one or so, you inevitably, there's no escape from that. They have to leave two signatures. One, the uh, induced gravitational waves, secondary gravitational waves, non-linearly produced, or some CMB mu distortions, depending on your primordial black hole masses. Um, so this means the following. If you produce primordial black holes mass larger than 0.1 or one, anyway, you have to leave either a signature at gravitational waves or mu distortions. If you don't see any signal in both of these guys, it is certain that even if you have extremely non-Gaussian signal, you, uh, there's not enough primordial black holes in the universe. They cannot change any of our uh, energy density. Um, you may say that, okay, we didn't see anything, but do we learn anything else? Of course we learn, what is that? As you see, we also constrain P zeta enormously. Remember that at CMB scales, which are corresponding to roughly these scales, 10 to the minus two, three, four, uh, we probe P zeta 10 to the minus nine level. And we have very tiny information about these large scales, but with these mu distortions and uh, pulsar timing arrays, we will be probing or constraining the primordial perturbations as good as 10 to the minus eight, and here about 10 to the minus five or six level. So we rule out that there is no possibility that P zeta is larger than that. But then Can you may ask, yes. You have uh, 40 seconds. Perfect. But then you may ask the following, the other way around. What is that question? Assume the PBH has really some fraction of dark matter. Can you be able to detect them in either uh, mu distortions or the uh, SK? And the answer is here. For a signal to noise ratio about three, you probe anything between 10 to the four to one of solar masses for these primordial black holes. Um, so let me conclude, uh, just go to the abstract of our paper. So the conclusion is that um, mu distortion experiments from electromagnetic signals and the pulsar timing array experiments from next generation gravitational wave probes will probe the smaller scales of inflation uh, most robustly, most uh, sensitively and strongly. And if there is any sign of primordial black holes larger than one solar mass, or if primordial black holes are forming the supermassive black holes anyway, we will see it. And if we don't see anything, they're not there. And this is a conclusive test.
Thank you very much. I, yeah. I really enjoyed uh, the, the patch you, you made of different uh, sources <laughs> to show <laughs> us things. So unfortunately, we don't have time for questions uh, right now. So I, I encourage everybody to send uh, a message directly to Kanner. Thanks again. Very nice, a very nice talk. So we can move on to our last speaker for this session, Bradley. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Fine. I see Good. you. I can hear you. Uh, let's try and share my screen. Perfect. Uh, Great. So you're going to have 20 minutes, uh, Bradley. I'm going to give you a warning after 10. Uh, just a moment. Okay, I don't uh, see your slides anymore now. Yeah. Uh, just a second. Uh, Sorry about this. That's all right. Okay, let's try this again. Okay. There we go. Yes. Okay. Oh. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, first of all, uh, to the organizers uh, for putting on such an interesting workshop and for providing a nice uh, Brazilian soundtrack to the, to the whole thing. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about uh, dark matter and black holes and, and gravitational waves and Gianfranco kind of signposted some of this stuff on Wednesday uh, when he gave uh, the first talk of the workshop. Um, and he showed in particular this uh, plot, which is from a, a kind of white paper sort of review that we wrote uh, last year, which is a kind of broad overview of the kind of, uh, the kind of different probes that you can use in gravitational waves to look for different uh, kinds of dark matter classified uh, by the mass of the dark matter particle. Okay, so we're talking from very light to sort of bosonic dark matter up to uh, macroscopic compact object dark matter. Um, and the, the probe that I'm gonna talk about today is, uh, is this one here. So uh, IMRI dephasing, okay. Uh, and the reason that I'm talking about it, well, one of the reasons that I'm interested in it is that it's, uh, it offers the chance to detect dark matter over a huge range of dark matter masses, and it just depends on the gravitational interactions of the dark matter, okay? So in some sense, it, it, it offers some kind of model-independent prospects, okay? And so first, I'll tell you what uh, IMRIs are, then I'll tell you what dephasing is, and then I'll uh, tell you something about some of the work we've been doing. Okay, so... Um, First of all, IMRIs are intermediate mass ratio in spirals. Okay, so the picture you should have is you have some uh, relatively massive uh, black hole, intermediate mass black hole at the center of this system, something like 10 to the three, 10 to the five solar masses. And then orbiting round, you have a smaller compact object, maybe order one solar mass, maybe a neutron star or a black hole. I'll sometimes just call it a neutron star for now, just, just to distinguish between the black hole at the center. What this system will do over time is, uh, as the neutron star orbits, it emits gravitational waves, and the, this orbit decays. And so if you were to look at the gravitational waves from this system, you would see, uh, amid the noise, some kind of uh, sine wave-like signal in your gravitational waves, which is gradually getting higher in frequency as the system uh, in spirals, and also higher in amplitude. Okay. The, the typical uh, sort of orbital period of these systems that we're interested in is sort of between one and uh, 1,000 seconds. And so we're going to be looking for gravitational waves that are between uh, 10 to the minus 3 hertz and 1 hertz in, in frequency. Okay, and so we're really not looking up at this high frequency range that LIGO would be interested in, but really a, a, a future space-based uh, interferometer such as LISA. Okay, which is really sensitive down at this uh, 10 to the minus 2 hertz frequency range. Uh, and you, you can try and do some kind of population modeling to, to guess uh, how many of these systems, these uh, asymmetric binaries LISA might observe. And, you know, the, there are some optimistic suggestions that LISA might detect a few of these systems per year. But we're interested not only in gravitational waves, but also dark matter. And uh, as Marco Chianese uh, discussed this morning, 
depending on how this intermediate mass black hole forms, it can have a very dense cloud of dark matter around it, okay? uh, sometimes called a spike. Um, and this, this dense cloud can be, well, one of the, the possible descriptions is that it has this sort of power law density profile. You have some normalization uh, and then a very steeply rising density uh, towards the center controlled by uh, some slope, which if you assume that this black hole formed at the center of an NFW halo uh, has, has a particular value. Okay. And the interesting thing here is that very close to the intermediate mass black hole, the density of dark matter can reach huge, huge values, okay? You know, many, many orders of magnitude larger than the local density. Okay, so these, this starts to be an interesting probe um, uh, of, of dark matter in these extreme systems. Okay, and the reason that we're interested in dark matter in these systems is, uh, is because of dynamical friction. Okay, and uh, Ryan discussed this, I think, also on Wednesday. The idea is that you have this neutron star or black hole orbiting around the intermediate mass black hole. And as it does so, uh, it, it deflects and uh, deflects dark matter particles along these trajectories, creating a gravitational wake and effectively a drag force on this, on this orbiting compact object. Okay. And this causes the compact object to lose, uh, lose energy. Okay. And so, the system that we're really looking for, the system that we think is interesting is, is, is this one, an IMRI, so an intermediate mass uh, black hole at, with a neutron star or black hole orbiting embedded in this dark matter halo. Um, what's interesting is that including this dark matter halo means that there's an extra channel for energy loss, which means that the, the binary can in-spiral faster. And so uh, if I kind of align these two sort of illustrated waveforms at some time zero, and I look back in time at how the waveforms have evolved to get to that point, I see that this orange curve is accumulating phase much faster. Okay, it's in spiraling faster. And this is why it's called dephasing, because if you start off at some point in time, you can tell the environmental effect of the dark matter just by this shift in phase between, uh, between the, two, uh, the two waveforms. Okay, and it's not always helpful to to think in terms of this oscillating strain, but instead to think of think in terms of the phase or, or the number of gravitational wave cycles. Okay, so if we start at some time and, and work backwards or, or we could work forwards, whatever, you can think of you know, how many gravitational wave cycles have I accumulated over time? Okay, and, and it's the difference between these two curves, uh, which is the, the dephasing. Okay, it's this delta n cycles between these two curves which is going to be a kind of diagnostic of how big an effect uh, this is. So that was the, the, the kind of illustration. Um, and Ada et al. Uh, looked into this, uh, this kind of signal uh, a few years ago now. And, uh, you know, if, if we look at a relatively realistic or, you know, kind of benchmark system, you could imagine a, a 1000 solar mass black hole at the center being orbit orbited by this light object. Um, and you want to know, you know, how big is this change in the number of cycles between the system without dark matter and the system with dark matter? And so what I plotted here is, is a similar thing to what, what you saw a moment ago, but just re-expressed uh, in a slightly different way. So I'm plotting here the change in the number of cycles due to the presence of dark matter from some initial frequency until uh, the final merger. Okay, so uh, the merger happens at relatively high frequency, so there aren't many cycles of difference. But if you start out very far uh, from, the, from the merger at low frequency or a large separation, then you can have a very large change in the number of cycles uh, comparing the vacuum case without dark matter to the case with dark matter. Okay, if, if we take a sort of five-year uh, to merger scenario here, in the vacuum case, we expect sort of six times 10 to the six cycles, but actually in, the, in this dephased case, uh, including the effects of dark matter, you can change that number of cycles by uh, a, a few million. Okay, so this, is a, this could be a huge effect. Uh, and this, is, uh, this huge effect might allow us to detect dark matter. And that's really what Marco was talking about uh, earlier today. 
Okay, and that was kind of the starting point for uh, this paper, which which we have been working on for a couple of years, but, but came out earlier this year. And we, we wanted to look at this effect in more detail because it's so interesting. So the first thing we asked was, what's the energy budget available for this? Okay, right. so, you know. Right. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. You have 10 minutes until the end of the total time. Perfect, thank you. Um, so the total energy, um, this is such a huge effect. Uh, you know, do we have enough energy in the system to, to do the kind of work that we're interested in doing? Okay, uh, and so um, the question is, where does this energy come from? And the answer is it, it comes from injecting energy into the dark matter and essentially pushing it away, unbinding it. And so what we could do is we could compare uh, the, the total uh, amount of work that we're trying to do with dynamical friction in the calculation that I showed you before versus the total amount of energy stored in the binding energy of dark matter. And what we find is that it's the, the, the amount of work we're trying to do is actually a, a lot bigger than the amount of energy stored in the dark matter. Okay, so this tells us that something's, something's up here. We're trying to do more work than is available in the, in the system. And so one very simple thing you could do is what happens if this process is perfectly efficient? And as we spiral inwards from one radius to the next, what happens if we extract all of the possible energy? Okay, we extract all of the binding energy of dark matter and, and we inspiral like that. Okay, and so you can do the same calculation for the number of cycles, um, kind of stripping away the dark matter shell by shell. And you find that the size of the effect is much, much smaller, okay, uh, an order of magnitude or maybe two, okay, the, this difference in the phase is, is not actually as big as you might expect it to be. Okay, we tried to then do a, a more detailed calculation. Uh, you can describe this, uh, uh, this distribution of dark matter particles by some distribution function, which depends on their energy. Um, and as particles move around in the system, if they if they cross close to the, the orbiting compact object, then they can receive a kick in energy and be uh, shifted to a different energy level, which changes the distribution of the dark matter particles. Okay. Um, and so essentially, it, this amounts to trying to calculate uh, the rate at which energy is injected in this kind of torus of influence, which is swept out by the, the orbiting compact object. Um, there's the full detail, the full calculation is, is a little detailed. Um, I would recommend maybe going to the paper or uh, taking a look at some code that we wrote to be able to do this. But in the end, what, what you can do is you can then do essentially a self consistent full calculation. You can take into account the emission of gravitational waves and the energy that's injected into the dark matter halo. Um, to try and come up with a, a kind of careful calculation. Okay, and so what I'm plotting here is uh, the, the density of dark matter okay, around the, uh, the intermediate mass black hole as a, function of the, um, as a function of the distance from the intermediate mass black hole. Okay, and we'll focus on this red line, which essentially is all the slow moving dark matter particles because they're, it turns out they're the only ones that are really interesting for us uh, for dynamical friction. And what we can do is we can in basically inject this uh, small um, compact object at some radius and then see how the system evolves. Okay, and so uh, over time, the, this compact object injects energy as it orbits round and starts to deplete particles near its radius. Okay, and it starts to kick those particles out to a higher radius as it injects energy into them. Okay, and so that was sort of this initial like burn in phase. Uh, and then we'll, we'll speed up the simulation. And at the same time, we have gravitational wave emission, which is trying to drag the system in, and also energy being injected into the halo. Okay, so as we uh, in spiral, dark matter particles get kicked out further, in spiral a bit more, you kick out some particles. Crucial thing to notice is that this. Uh, the density experienced by the orbiting object is always less than it would be if you had kept the whole thing fixed in the first place. Okay, so what this means is that, as we saw with this shell estimate, the, 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 the impact of, of this dephasing is going to be a bit smaller than, than we expected. 
And so then we can we can now do this kind of self-consistent calculation of the of the number of cycles. Okay, so we had the case where you have fixed dark matter, the case where you have some kind of uh, optimistic uh, upper limit of the size of this effect by just stripping away all of the dark matter, and then this self-consistent calculation that we've done here. Okay, and we find that the size of this effect goes from something like 10 to the 6 cycles uh, or an order 1 effect over 5 years down to a sort of percent level effect. Okay, so th this is a huge change, but it's the first time that anyone's managed to do a, a calculation uh, that at least conserves uh, energy, which, which is always a nice first step. The good thing is that LISA is, or should be, incredibly precise, incredibly accurate, and so it should be able to detect dephasings as small as a few cycles. Okay, so there's still hope and still uh, reasons to, to keep looking forward. So I'll skip this. So there are lots of things we want to do in the future, improve the modeling of these systems, uh, look for how you would actually search through the data. But one thing that we're working on at the moment is uh, prospects for, for detection and, and for reconstructing the parameters of this dark matter uh, spike. Okay, and so the, this is now sort of some preliminary work that we're doing. Uh, and the idea is imagine that you've observed some gravitational wave signal, which is from this uh, dressed black hole system. Um, and then you don't know that it's from this dressed black hole system. And so what you have to do is you have to compare this, uh, this gravitational waveform with some vacuum system. So some binary which has, uh, which has no dark matter and you, you want to compare the shape of the waveform or the, the, the amount of dephasing that you get comparing the, this these many possible vacuum waveforms with, uh, with this dressed waveform to see if it's possible to get a match, right? The reason you want to do this is to say, it, is there some way, it, is it possible always to say that this is definitely some dephased waveform and, and it never looks like some other vacuum waveform, okay? And the, the, the parameter that I have to tune here is this, the chirp mass of the, of the vacuum system. Okay, and so here I'm plotting the number of cycles uh, starting at some particular frequency and ending at another frequency. And if, if you just had a horizontal line here, it would mean that the phase evolution of this system matched perfectly. Uh, and so you can get the phase evolution to match uh, in the late in spiral where a lot of these curves go flat, um, but you really can't match it over the whole thing. Okay, and so this is a very important suggestion that you should be able uh, to distinguish these dressed systems from uh, from the vacuum systems, um, just just by looking at, at this dephasing signature. Okay, so that's that's very hopeful. Um, we're looking also at uh, you know prospects for for reconstructing the parameters of the spike, but I'm running a little short on time, so I'll probably uh, wrap up. So hopefully um, you heard from Marco. Uh, earlier this morning about how exciting this dephasing signal is, how it can let you probe uh, the dark matter density around uh, intermediate mass black holes with future detectors. Unfortunately, these systems uh, are a little more tricky than people initially thought, but we've hopefully made the first uh, step towards, uh, you know, towards an accurate description of them. And we're, we're currently working uh, with all of these collaborators that are listed here. And especially uh, this later work is, is uh, led a lot by Adam Coogan, who's a postdoc in Amsterdam. We're working to develop some sort of new search strategies and look at the prospects for recovering the properties of the dark matter from, from a signal if we ever find one. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Bradley, for the very nice talk. So we have uh, uh, 30 seconds for questions. <laughs> Uh, I don't see any for the moment. Okay, so since uh, since we are a bit late, uh, I think, yeah. If, uh, so, do you if, have any uh, feeling if uh, how much this analysis could change if your intermediate uh, black hole is spinning? So, if you have car background, I I don't have a good feeling for it. Um, the, the, this whole, everything that we've done is, is very, uh, kind of very simplified. Um, and you know, the, the dark matter halo and the, the, the binary has, 
or at least the, the central black hole has kind of no angular momentum. And so, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a very good feeling with it. And we're, we're just step by step trying to um, trying to build up the complexity of the problem and, and work out where the degeneracies lie. Sure, yeah, I understand. I mean, it's impressive what you already done. So. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, very good. So I think this is a good moment to wrap up the session. We are a few minutes late, but uh, fortunately we have a small break now. So Bradley, thanks again for the very nice talk. And I would Thank like you. also to extend uh, my thanks to all the speakers of this very nice session. So uh, we are going now to have a few minutes break and I pass the word to Ivoni who is gonna chair next session.